of Facebook. It's it's fine. You don't need Facebook to view these. All right. Here, let me record. All right, so Lizzie, can we go back to the first poster, pretty please? And thank you so very, very much. All right, welcome, welcome everyone to Red or Green Books. Today is our debut, Meet the Poets. It is so, so, so exciting for us uh, that we are debuting these amazing uh, authors, human beings, poets, spoken word artists. Uh, they're just um, an honor and a privilege to work with, as I'm sure all of you who are here supporting them today. We have uh, uh, A.D. Harris and C.D. McClendon. It's a father-son team doing a book of, of love poetry to their wives. We have Eddie Youssef Aziz from Lebanon, uh, Elizabeth Oots, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss, Gary Huskisons from the UK. We got Hill Hoover, Kimberly KMA Anderson from South Africa, Christy Scr Dribbles, a lantern carrier from the UK, Maureen Medina hails from Portugal and uh, by way of New York City, and uh, Patti Orozco, Stephanie Eisler Vance, SZ Putnam, Terry Rose Jertson, and Thomas Connor. Those are the Fierce 15 poets for you uh, today. They will each have 10 minutes to uh, talk about themselves, their work, and read for you today. You get a, an opportunity to hear from all of these incredible human beings. All right, next slide, pretty please, Lizzie. So we've put together a raffle. This is so much fun. Uh, we do a raffle for the launches. Well, at least we did for the original 10. Uh, it worked really, really well. So we're doing a raffle giveaway for the collection of all 15 poetry books. So if you would like to get a ticket uh, we will be drawing for the winner August 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You do not need to be present to win. Tickets are $5 each, five for 20 or 30 for 100. You can cash at Marissa Prada or PayPal me at marissa at redergreenbooks.com. All of the proceeds from this raffle will go to fund the LGBTQ anthology that is coming out. Uh, we have, uh, we did the women's erotic anthology with the proceeds last year. Uh, this year we're doing the LGBTQ anthology and a men's and them erotic anthology uh, for uh, uh, for the uh, for the press. All right. Uh, it, when you purchase tickets, please indicate in the notes section uh, your name. Uh, your email and any contact information so that we know how to get to you if you win. Of course, visit the website redergreenbooks.com. Red is R-E-A-D because I live in New Mexico and everything is red or green chili here. We are partnering with Guerrilla Poets on this launch. Uh, they are doing, uh, they do our in-house cover art for the majority of the books that we uh, publish here at Red or Green Books. All right, next slide, please, Lizzie. Thank you so much. Um, Poet Palooza has been scheduled and I apologize that the date seems super bright on the screen. It's a little hard to read. Poet Palooza is our annual poetry event where we invite back all of the authors who we have published in the past years to come and read at this event. So far it includes the original 10 poets, the next 10, the Fierce 15, the Women from Touching Tongues, the Erotic Anthology. And of course we will include the LGBTQ anthology contributors as those come to light and, um, and are selected. That will be Sunday, August 7th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. The Zoom's already set, the posters are everywhere. They're on social media, they're on the website. You cannot miss it. Uh, you do not want to miss this show. I believe there's already 20 pe about 20 people signed up and it's not until August. If you think August is a long ways away, no, it's not. No, it's not. I bet you guys didn't think 2022 is gonna come here as quick. Uh, it is a, is a blink away. All right, next uh, slide, please, Lizzie. Last one today. We have a call for LGBTQ plus poetry. Submissions that have been extended through April 15th, tax day. Uh, feel free to email our very own Elizabeth Sophia Strauss at estrauss91 at gmail.com. Again, information is on the website uh, for that. If you uh, don't have a chance to take a photograph or write down the email, the posters are everywhere, Facebook, Instagram, and the website. All right, thank you so much, Lizzie, for the uh, screen share on that. Thank you so much for... Um, 
uh, getting those posters nice and sharp and colorful for us today. Uh, I am your host and publisher, Marissa Prada. I hail from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Give you a little bit of background if you're not familiar with the press. We started this press during COVID. <laughs> a bunch of us female poets got together and, and we said, well, why don't we just publish our books? Because it was hard to find a publisher, a good publisher, and it was hard to um, not pay an arm and a leg. And it was really hard not to let go of, of the power and the control on our work. So what we did was we said, well, let's just publish uh, together. And then as we started doing research, I said, well, what we should do is, uh, is publish in large groups. And so I started Red or Green Books, which was a press I always had intended to publish because I have six or seven different genres of literature over the last 25 years. And uh, so that's how we became uh, the, you know, who we are today. We're female forward. Uh, the majority of the poets we publish are females. Um, it is run uh, by women. We work with women, small business authors, small business uh, poetry um, people. We try to keep as much stuff in-house as possible and uh, really promoting underserved, underprivileged minority groups. And so it's a very, very fun and exciting vision and journey that this has been. Uh, I'm constantly amazed at the amount of love and support from all of you um, that we are continuing to do what we do in launching these amazing works of art. All right. Um, so the next show will be May 15th. That will be the readathon. Uh, pre orders will go on sale. We will debut the cover art for the books. Uh, poets, it'll be very similar to this show. Uh, these poets will be all gathered together again reading, but they get to read direct, they get to read from their books, the words, the works that they've selected. You get to see their cover art. Shane Maynard from Gorilla Poets uh, will be able to talk about the cover art uh, and, and how it came about and all of that wonderful stuff. Poet Con, Ross Fias in the house. She's one of the original 10 poets. Oh, it's here at Red or Green Books, paying it forward, paying the love forward for all these debut authors. Um, I believe the next show, the book signing, the actual book signing, uh, book launch and signing will be July 10th. Uh, that is when you should have your books in your hot little hands. And these poets will be signing books live in person for you. Uh, so start to get your pre-orders in. Talk to the poets today. All of their information is on the website, their bios, their handles, all of that good stuff. Uh, so definitely go to the website. If there's a poet who, who piques your interest today, uh, maybe you don't have time to write down their handles, just go to the website. All of their bios are there. All right, without further ado, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Eddie Youssef Aziz. I was so excited that Eddie joined us. I met Eddie in um, uh, Sidewalk Beirut. Uh, which is a, a wonderful open mic uh, forum uh, that Mason Nasser had started. I'm sure there were some other folks involved. My apologies for not naming all of them, but that is where I met Eddie and his work has just really been stunning. And then to learn about what he's been doing in his personal gr growth life uh, with his education and his work is just awesome. So I will read his bio. I'll bring him up. After Eddie will be Elizabeth Utz. Eddie Youssef Aziz is a 25-year-old Lebanese poet and teacher from Batroun. And if I say this wrong, if I mispronounce anything, you guys, please just correct me. Batroun, the north of Lebanon. He's a proud member of Sidewalk Beirut and the founder and host of his hometown's it, Sidewalk Beirut and is the founder and host of his hometown's collective, Sidewalk Batroun, Batroun, since 2018. Eddie has performed in various venues and manages creative writing workshops in local and international communities and in schools and universities. He believes that poetry is everywhere and has always been focused on making it accessible to the public, especially younger members of society. Feel free to unmute your mics, cheer on our poets as they come to the stage. Eddie Youssef Aziz! Woo! Woo! Yes. Woo! No one will know. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Marissa, for, for this beautiful introduction and uh, for everyone to be, uh, for being here. It's, it's amazing. 
Um, yeah, I think I was gonna talk a bit about myself, but uh, the bio I think uh, says it all. I'm an English teacher, I'm a poet, I'm from Lebanon, I currently live here. I just shaved and cut myself and <laughs> it shows. And um, yeah, I live in this beautiful coastal town uh, of Batoun in the north of Lebanon. Everyone come, I'll show you around. And um, yeah, so I'll talk a bit about the book. Uh, the book is titled On Coffee Stains, um, which is not the original title I wanted to go with, but then I started thinking that I live, like you can see this over here, you can see my t-shirt, uh, this small pebble I have here. I, I love coffee. I'm a teacher. We all drink a lot of coffee. And um, this specific um, coffee cup is something that I'm obsessed with. It's, it's part of my personality. It's a personality trait now. Uh, to me, everyone who sees this cup uh, immediately thinks of me. Uh, and this is how I came with, because I also have a few poems titled uh, on coffee stains. So I decided to go with this uh, title. In addition that coffee stains are mistakes that happen that could be cleaned up, that could be fixed, but come in, but also they could be uh, avoided by having a coaster there or by having something there. So I imagine that this would be a great thing to, to encompass my uh, collection. Plus the collection focuses a lot on, uh, since I'm young, I'm only 25, I've experienced certain things with love, certain things with breakup, with heartbreak, with um, uh, relationships, people I've met, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I decided that this would be the entire theme or topic of uh, the book. So I'm not going to talk any. I'm not going to talk anymore. But I'm going to read uh, the first, the very first book, uh, the very first poem from uh, the book, which is called "On Coffee Stains uh, One." <clears throat> I broke my heart one more time. And as the smile that once decorated your face fell, I did too. So did my, my tears, my heart, my hopes. I said, you'll find someone better, someone willing to settle down, someone willing to give you all the love and affection you need, someone willing to say to the stars when asked where to. You held my hands when you first arrived at the cafe I asked you to meet me at and sat at the table across from me. Your hand is holding the coffee cup I ordered for you before you got here. You liked your coffee black. What happened, you asked. What's changed, what's wrong, I shut down. I shut down, I shut up, I shut my eyes, thinking of the first time we held hands, the first time we kissed under the stars, the first time we kissed under the rain, the first time we kissed under the sheets, the first time we said, I love you, and suddenly I regretted saying all the things I just said, how I'm not ready, how I'm lost and I'm unwilling to be found, how I felt like the coffee I ordered for you, dark and bitter. But your smile fell now. And so did my heart, my hopes, and my tears. You said, when did all of this start to happen? I couldn't answer. How can someone pinpoint a specific time he fell out of love? Does a bird with broken wings realize it's no longer flying before it hits the ground? I saw the smile fall from your face. And with that, I knew that with everything I said, we did too. Thank you. Uh, the second poem I'm going to read is one I love, love, love performing. Um, but I need to get there first. <laughs> Here it is. It's one I really love performing. It's more of the performance uh, to me than it is um, the page. It, but I love it. It's called, I promise to never call your name. <clears throat> your name is like a punch in the throat. One hard enough to kill my voice, but my voice is not that easily killed. My voice will call your name loud enough you'd see the middle finger it's raising. 
My voice will say your name and spit blood right after it. The same blood you used to tattoo your name on my lips. The same blood I will always taste when I kiss someone else. My voice will whisper your name and follow it with a slow breath. A breath of relief, a breath willing to put a dying man out of his misery. My voice will say your name, and it will promise to never speak of it again. But also, my voice will call you at night to tell you to come over, to tell you I'm sorry, to tell you that I've been lonely, to tell you that the whiskey in the freezer is not cold enough. To, my voice will call your name and say not again. Again, at the same time, my voice is sad. Your name is sad. My voice saying your name is sad. My voice is breaking. My neck is sore. My eyes can barely open. My fingers have never felt this stiff. My knees can no longer handle holding both the weight of both of our voices. My knees can no longer handle carrying the weight of your heart fighting with mine. My heart fighting with my brain. My brain fighting with my mouth. My mouth fighting with my voice. My voice fighting with your name. Your name fighting with every breath I take. Every decision I make. Every collision I fall into. Every heartbreak that ends up with my bed full of sweat and my heart full of naked bodies like cigarette butts residing at the bottom of the ashtray, finishing up the harmony work they've done. My voice is like secondhand smoke. You will feel it entering your body, leaving beautiful damage to your insides, even when you don't ask for it. This was my uh, second poem. I think I have time for a third one. Ah. You got, uh, yeah, you've got like four minutes left. Awesome. Good. Perfect. Uh, I need to find it first. Yeah. Uh, on long nights and loud parties. I love this one. Yeah, I love all of them. All right. <laughs> My nights are becoming longer. The sun is taking its time to rise as if he and the blue sky are at war. But love, the war is in fact between me and the little whispers in my head. The ones that even six glasses of scotch wouldn't shut down. The war is between my eyes and the darkness of the night. You see, love, the problem is that my eyes have grown accustomed to the darkness of the night, that even the rustles of the sun's, sun's chariot cannot break their bond. I wish my thoughts and I could grow this close. At least they would leave me alone when the sky starts to fall, when the stars seem closer, when the future they see coming it wouldn't be so far away, when you almost feel non-existent like my sleep at night, because love, I know that somewhere in someone's bed under someone's sheets, you let out a cry calling out my name, and I cannot even gather the courage to say yours. Love, I've been lonely. I've been begging my poems to, start, to stop being so loud, my arms to stop being weighed down, my thoughts to stop being so worried, waking every wincing breath I could waste, wondering of whys and how comes, shaking shackled down, short breaths, shy, scared shitless, showing me everything that could go wrong. Love, I need a friend. Those whispers drove people away and I could try to hang on to their fading voices, but the party in my head gets louder and louder and I fail to do anything about it. Love, I tried, trust me, I tried. I just couldn't hold anyone close anymore. Our fights at 2 a.m. have gotten the best of me and I am just tired. I've been carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. That's four years. That's four heartbreaks, 25 years of silence, and 38 stories. I haven't told anyone balancing between the throat and the necklace choking it. Love, I'm tired. Trust me. I'm tired. My eyes need to shut. The sun needs to come out. That's it. Oh my goodness, y'all. Unmute your mics, please. Give it up for our first poet today, Eddie Yusuma. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Amazing. Wow. amazing. Wow. Really, yeah, truly really amazing. Awesome. Thank you, really. All right, I'm going to answer a question y'all are going to have, which is how do I get the books? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and even though in May, when we do uh, the readathon, uh, these poets are going to be having pre orders going on sale. Some of them have them already available, uh, even though the book is not gone to print yet. Uh, the book uh, due date to go to print is June 1st 
Uh, so we, we have some time. We're really in the very infancy phase of this launch. This is to generate uh, some buzz for you guys to hopefully share, support, uh, get these poets, amplify, um, amplify their journey, their mission. Uh, and help them build on, on this momentum as we move to print. Uh, so this is a very, very early stage in the launch. Please contact the poets. You can also do that through the press, um, through the website, all their contact information is in their bios. And uh, we're asking that first you purchase directly from the poets. Our mission here at Red or Green Books is for these poets to sell through all of their author copies. Uh, we want them to make the money. Uh, if you were to purchase the book through the press, we will send them the money anyway and tell them uh, uh, to ship it to you. Now keep in mind, please, there are five international poets on this launch, which means the shipping will vary from those poets and will be more than what you will find in the US. Uh, the books retail at 15 US dollars uh, plus shipping. So uh, if you have questions about what the cost for those shipping rates will be, you feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we can try to calculate that based on where you are and where the book is going. Uh, but that is going to be a little bit of a thing. All right. The only thing that's available for you to purchase right now is the pre-order of all 15 books on the Red or Green Books website. Uh, their pre-orders are not up because I want you to pre-order through the poets. Uh, so please do that. Uh, please reach out to them and get, their pre get your pre-orders in. Uh, and that will be uh, an awesome way that you can do that. But if you do want all 15 in one bundle that is available through the press, international shipping is extra. All right, moving on. Uh, we have Elizabeth Oots, uh, who I met through Guerrilla Poets. I'm so excited that she is here. Y'all, these poets are going to blow your mind. Uh, there is something for everyone today. Every single one of them is different and beautiful. So I will read her bio uh, as we get going today. Elizabeth is a poet, artist, and community volunteer living in Charlotte, North Carolina with her family and two nutty, destructive cats. <laughs> Originally from South Carolina, she began writing poems and short stories in elementary school, continued through college writing, oh, excuse me, winning Furman University's annual poetry award in 1990. In 2020, Elizabeth left corporate America with zero regrets, rediscovering her love for words, paint, and the art and the arts community. This book is 30 plus years in the making and just the beginning. You can uh, find all of her social media again on the website redergreenbooks.com. Please unmute your mics. Give it up for Elizabeth. Oots, everybody. Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh. I don't think I want to follow Eddie. <laughs> I was like, uh, and then I'm gone. Uh, no, so thank you for having me. Um, yeah, like um, Marissa said, we met through, actually through Shane, um, and she's kind of my book coach and, and mentor and all that good stuff. So yeah, I started writing a million years ago, <laughs> it feels like. Um, and yeah, since I quit my, I, I, since I quit my job, I've had a lot more time to do other stuff, which I really love. So um dusted off a bunch of poems that were literally 30 something years old. Um, some were okay, some I redid, and then some like I told Shane just showed up like last week. So um, I, the title of my book is Was. Um, it's, I don't know, I, my favorite poet is Mary Oliver. So in some, in some sense, I would love to be compared to her. Um, they're very lyrical, um, not spoken words. So very different from what, from what Eddie's are, but um, I hope you like them anyway. Um, and the, the theme of the book is really just kind of reminiscence, um, nostalgia, um, things I remember from my childhood, um, and then interwoven with that, just some, some exploring of trauma and things that happened that have maybe who I am. So um, I have got a couple poems to read. Let me see, hold on, I can do this. And just, you know, this is only the second time I've ever read in public. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> so bear with me one second. Um, the first poem is the opening poem from the book. Um, and actually this one came through a Charlotte writer's 
um, group, uh, they had a prompt and it was about new, it was New Year's Day. So it was, it was about resolutions. So this one's called Resolution from the Latin Resolvere. Before we made this a New Year's attempt to force ourselves to be better, to do more, stop this, start that. It meant to release, to loosen, to give over and let things go. This year, I will let go of self-hate, people who are no longer friends, fears that no longer serve me. I will loosen the tight red threads of anxiety that cut off my circulation like a string on my finger, reminding me that everything will never be okay. I will unwind the knot that sits a millimeter in front of my heart, causing beats to skip, pressing on my lungs so no breath is ever de a deep cleansing one. I will slacken the noose that will snap my neck every time she's sad for too long in the bathroom with razors, asleep for days, all the things that will rock the chair from beneath my feet. So that was the first one. And let's see, I've got one more. Mine will be short. <laughs> Uh, this one is called Christmas Lights, and this is just uh, the Christmas lights that stay up on my porch all year long now since COVID. Christmas lights on the screen porch, still up in June, compete with fireflies, fewer and further between, still magical and miraculous. You shine like those lights, steady and strong, unfaltering, set to come on at seven, and go off at midnight, artificial but dependable until the power goes out a summer storm blowing trees onto transformers, then you go dark, useless glass baubles on a line. I'm the flickering insect's pale flash, creamy yellow, lasting just minutes after the sun goes down and the temperature drops, flashing a signal to the universe, see me, see me, but eclipsed by you under the until the thunder rages and the ozone snaps the connection. That's it. <laughs> That's it. All right. Are you sure you got some time left? No, no, no. Okay. Oh, you got on. some time left. You can that read was nice. I know. I read fast. Sorry. You're you're doing great, Elizabeth. This is great. We love it. All right. Elizabeth, we want more. More. Okay. <laughs> Gary's these calling. Are, yeah. These two are 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 funnier, I think. Um, and about doors for whatever reason. I leave doors open on the off chance that opportunity wants to come in without knocking. I leave windows up for fairies and hope and desperation. I leave the flu open for obvious reasons, but drawers must be closed for order, for appearances, to keep the secrets in and eyes out. And one more, a door poem again. I don't know why the doors. Um, when one door closes, another door opens, but sometimes it's the door to an empty elevator shaft pitch black, echoing empty, one step and you're gone, or a louvered door, squeaky hinges, jamming at every attempt to close so you just give up, or a Dutch door, the top locked so you have to duck under, careful not to bump your head. When one door closes, maybe don't look for other open doors, find a window so you can see what's next. Oh my goodness. Elizabeth, it was you guys. Woo. Unmute your Loved mic. It. Please give it Loved up for us. Second poet. Great. This is so much fun, y'all. Like, seriously, you become pros. The more we do this, the more comfortable we get in our skin, right? Because page poetry and spoken word um, are, are very different beasts and um the fact that you can come here and publish and get out of your comfort zone, right? Because I say, here's your comfort zone. Success is way back there, okay? Uh, you can do it with a group, with a team behind you, with people pushing you up. You don't have to do it alone. And that's the most important thing. So uh, we love you, Elizabeth. We welcome your poetry. We're so, so glad you're part of this launch. 
All right, that being said, next up we have Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. There is not enough time in the day to talk about this woman. Uh, I'm so excited that not only do I get to publish her book of Pankus, which I'm sure she'll tell you what it is. She created this style of poetry. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, so she'll tell you what Pankus are, how she came about doing Pankus, but she is also part of our Word is Right family and, um, and does incredible shows and open mics at Word is Right. All right. Elizabeth is an author, activist, producer, publisher, and professor and realtor in New York City. Well, in New York now. She's the founder producer of Broadway Brokers Network and Broadway Stage Management Symposium, creator of the poetry style Pankus, known as spoken word artist Deadpan Lizzie the Beanie God. She's featured at the Norican Poets Cafe and worldwide and working on several Tony Award winning productions. Please unmute your mics, give a big round of applause for our next poet, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Uh, thank you so much, Beanie Blessings, Beanie everyone. Beanie, uh, Beanie Blessings uh, this afternoon. I'm half in New York City and half on Long Island, but Long Island today because I do real estate out here this weekend. Um, it is an incredible honor to be publishing uh, my second book of poetry, my first book of Pankus with Red or Green Books and The Word is Right. Um, Russian Shane, uh, Shane Maynard really wanted this with The Fierce 15 um, and we got it and it's finished, um, even the cover art. So if you want to learn more about that and see the cover art, uh, ES underscore Strauss on Instagram, I'll drop that all in the chat when I'm finished. Um, I'm so happy to be here with everyone. So yeah, you're probably wondering what a pan coup is. Well, pan coup comes from my spoken word artist name, Deadpan, which was created. Pan coups were created by Ron Mark Thompson, who some of you might know in our poetry community. Um, how pan coup started was through a burp. And I'm not actually even kidding. Uh, right before Nick Logos and Ron, Mark Thompson and I hosted um, the New Year's Eve Word is Right Zoom party uh, at the end of 2021. I burped and I said to my mother, when I belch, it sounds like King Kong roaring. And I was like, oh, that could be a poem. And instead of expanding, you know, on a free verse poem or making it into a triolet or something else, I just counted and I was like, Oh, it gets kind of finished and it's nine words. And nine is always nine has just been like a number that kind of is like my number in my life. And it's popped up in tarot readings and it's just kind of a number that kind of keeps me grounded. And I texted a fellow artist in our community. I said, Have you ever heard of a style of nine word poem? And she was like, No. And I said, Okay, I'm gonna create a style of poetry. And I couldn't think of a name of it, and then Ron came up with Pankus, and it just morphed into nine word poems and because there's three forms of pankus nine word poems or nine lines of nine words or nine stanzas of nine lines of nine words and the night last one is kind of a beast to write and there are two of them in the book um and then i just started writing it and over the course of two months i wrote it slash you heard marissa read my bio everything else in my life and kind of suffered a little bit of a mini nervous breakdown. But what helped me, besides Marissa and Shane and Nick Pia Logos getting me through that part of my life were prompts in creating this book. And I actually couldn't think of a title for this book for a while. I knew it kind of had to do with Kundalini and serenity and mental health and just kind of this little chat book of how to get through life. And then a lot of us are part of the New York and Poets Cafe, and we do Mondays and Thursdays and uh, hybrid and in-person. And La Bruja, and I believe he's here, Eddie Foreman, Eddie Potastic, we're just kind of rhyming with the word kundalini. And Eddie must have looked at me, and he goes, kundabini. And I texted him, and I said, oh, I think Eddie just gave me my title. So thank you, Eddie Foreman, for rhyming with La Bruja on a Thursday night open mic. But um, I'm going to... I love you too, Eddie. Thank you. But that's how these poems came about. Um, the book, book's finished, so it'll be out in the next couple months. And um, you can pre-order. I actually had a lot of pre-orders. So you can go to my website, elizabethsophiastrauss.com, and fill out the Google form to pre-order. Um, I'm going to just read 
one of each style of poems, but, you know, I guess just the, the, the reason, one of the reasons I hope, one thing I hope really people get out of the book is, you know, I don't believe in writer's block. So I also kept writing this for people who are like, oh, I feel stuck and I don't know how to expand on my poetry or just write, write nine words, start with nine words and nine breaths and see if that takes you to nine stanzas or any form of style. So that's, you know, I hope that helps any artist as they're trying to create their art and continuing with uh, that part of their life. And, you know, cause you can, if you feel stuck and you, your pen just can't kind of drain out the ink and your fingers feel too fragile to type on the keys, you know, you sneeze or you burp out nine words, it might just flow out as easily as you think. And something else I love about this book is it breaks the rules of grammar. Um, poetry you know you get to break the rules of grammar so I think I said the first um form which is just nine words but I'll say it again so the first poem in this book which is the first poem I've ever created is called belch roar when I belch I sound like King Kong roaring nine simple words but it makes up a poem and the second one I said was nine words of nine lines um this one is just called what it is, nine exhausted or sacred or scared pancos. My neck hurts with no one to rub it. My sore body tired of my heavy throbbing mind. My tired mind bored of my aching body. My hands that sting from the cold need someone who needs someone here to make them warm again. My brain exhausted from watching HBO and hot screens, watching what is outside my window, hoping for help longing for some of what they have going on. I don't have this and I'm curious if I will. And the last form I will, which is the nine stanzas, nine lines, nine words, can fill. And I hope people, you know, after this feel inspired, not just to um, buy the book, I hope you feel inspired to create your own forms of pancos. That's really what I wrote the book for. I want people to really get the idea of writer's block out of their head and uh, just start writing poetry. Um, so this poem, oops, I just lost my screen. This poem, which is nine stanzas of nine lines of nine words, is called The Long Day's Journey or Lifetime I Create, which the title itself is also a panko. Sitting in my own pain and sorrow, wishing I was not surprised by the crap that was thrown in my face as I walked the brisk streets of the concrete jungle I need a break from in hope of one more commission before I take a long hiatus from renting an apartment and transition to luxury sales. Owning I am a power broker regardless of what the other poets say and choose to not understand as they grab the mic hard, like they're giving an unwanted hand job, sitting here listening to nothing because I'm bored of my own playlist as backdoor covers run through my mind, sipping on lime seltzer because my empty water bottle fell in the subway yesterday. And though washed, I fear I will become more sickly from the jungle shit. Can someone mute themselves, please? Um, fear I'll become more sickly from the jungle shit. I am, am I rechargeable like batteries or I'm on the road to frying like almond milk in my kiki fridge, like my friendship with the person who named the refrigerator. I think of this friend and all I hear is static music. What used to make my heart flutter now makes my stomach turn like pasta boiling in my shitty rent controlled Upper West Side unit wishing they stopped covering me in their fetishized love. Thinking about my life as I transition, from one side of the park to the other, I suffered what I most would say is a nervous breakdown. No, why, no, I sat in the not as great as I thought it would be glass shower in the freezing cold two bedroom apartment, letting the water run over my naked body and fragile mind. Why did I sit on the floor for minutes? Did I need to? Was I simply copying what I'd seen in movies? Did it help? Not really. Did I guide myself to a safer space? Yes, did I make the right decision leaving? part-time suburban versus the other times in the city? I think so. Only time will tell. Today, the country won as I dragged myself back to what my, what some would say, posh flat as I went home with no commission and fear I would bounce from rental check to sales commissions and hop from island to island. 
if the management will come through, $1,000 is no small fee and one I am owed. Walking through cold down under the Manhattan Brooklyn Bridge this late morning and early afternoon. I remembered why I love Brooklyn and why I love Dumbo, the neighborhood, not the film. It is gorgeous and showcases my favorite blue blanket, the East River. I glided past the water and looked up at the historic piece of New York. I was not able to figure out until I got back to the train how I walk on it. Disappointing, like the check that has not been written. When you rent real estate, you rent my time too, but that is a risk realtors take walking through the post day blizzard Manhattan snow in order to close a deal terrorizing my mind like the ride in the MGM studios in Disney World, the elevator bumpy up to headquarters, a carpet as well to the accountant's office with my sword has always been stuck all 2022, all 30 years of my life in the stone like Arthur, I cannot pull it out. When will the sword finally giving me some wiggle room? Is it when I die? Is it too morbid? A po is, is this too morbid a poem for me? Am I allowed to be upset, disappointed, frustrated, scared, unhappy? Am I allowed to be happy ever? Sitting on my maternal grandparents' wearing couch, period cramps, hate on my body and mind. I think I finished this panku, no, no ibuprofen, able to relieve my pain day two of my cycle. The cramps stronger than day one. I cannot remember the last time I had powerful, uh, powerful, painful period cramps on the second full day. My cycle, I'd hope on day three, they subside. I need to catch a break. I believe I do deserve one. Do you? Skyscrapers closed in on me and I let them half win my journey through life, not dancing right now or perhaps tomorrow night. But I will choreograph a dance again when time feels right. So those are the three styles of po poetry in the book. That is a panku. You hear, you heard it first, and you know I'm just really honored um, that I get to publish this with Marissa and Shane and Red or Green Books, um, and that I'm feeling better. Most importantly, it's a journey. Um, and also, you thought at the beginning, uh, LGBTQ art anthology. We are looking for. It's not just poetry. It's an art anthology. Um, so if you have photography, if you have poetry, if you have lyrics, you just want page poetry, essays, I'm going to submit an essay myself. And if you identify in the LGBTQ plus community, please submit uh, to my email, which you saw there on uh, by April 15th. And also, I will say one more thing. If you are someone who is not ready to share their identity, if you identify in the LGBTQ community, uh, please know you can submit under pseudonym or pen name. You can change your pronouns. Um, we know it is a personal journey, not one we rush, but we want to include all the LGBTQ artists we can um, because we are a major part of this world. And that is extremely important. I do talk about that in the Pansy book too. So it's Kundabini, um, ES underscore Strauss on IG, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Dot com where my cash handles are, your, or if you want to learn more about real estate, where my real estate listings are. Um, but that's it for now. And I'm just, um, congratulations to the other uh, Fierce 14 poets. And yeah, and I can't wait to meet all you at Governor's Island. Yes! Y'all, oh. unmute your mics. Give it up for Elizabeth Sophia Strauss. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Ed, how interesting, right? I challenge all of you to write some pankus uh, and uh, just do something that gets you out of your comfort zone, right? Do anything. I think it's a, a brilliant idea what Lizzie has come up with and uh, an entirely new create, creative style of writing poetry. So if she could do it, you could do it, we could do it, let's go. All right, uh, next up, um, Oh my God, it's Hill Hoover. It's Hill Hoover! Wait, no, just kidding, it's Gary Huskisson. Sorry, oh. Gary. <laughs> oh. Just kidding. Oh. <laughs> Poor Gary. Poor oh. Gary. Oh my God. I always wanted Hill Hoover I am behind me. That has made my day. Love you, Hill. It's been a long time. <laughs> been See, that nice means together. I gotta follow you. Fun. You don't ring, you don't do any of that anymore, Hill. Every Saturday night we used to meet up, now it's like, oh, I'm an awful. Oh my God. If you guys need some sunshine in your life, you need Gary Huskisson in your life. Oh, I'm just saying, oh Gary is... makes everything better. Um, and the sparkle and the pizzazz and the energy and the love he brings, man. 
I'm so excited to know you, Gary. Um, I've met Gary in many uh, international poetry platforms, and I'm so excited to be doing your book, my friend. Oh my God, let's go. Gary Huskisson is a storyteller, poet, activist, pick and mix, event organizer, social and community worker, friend to the underdog, a purveyor of the unspoken word, and lover of apple crumble. Co-founder of Say It Louder and director of Stroud Against Racism. This collection illustrates Gary growing up as a Black British boy in a white world with reoccurring themes of social injustice to reflect 400 years of sy systemic racism. Born in Petersburg, Cambridge, UK, of parents from St. Vincent, West Indies. Please unmute your mics. Give a warm welcome to our next poet, Gary Huskison. Gary! Let's go, Gary. Gary. Can you believe I'm in a book with Sir Lantern Carrier? Sir Lantern, Lantern Carrier in England. We, we, we bowed down to him. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, I don't even know what to say. Oh, oh, well done. I, I, I'm, I'm very shy and I'm very nervous. And I'm scared of women, as you all well know. But, oh, Eddie. Eddie, I have to remember people's names. It was a great poem, Whiskey in the Jar. That's how I remember you. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, small but short. We need to talk. I'm happy divorced, but hey, we need to work on it. And Mrs. Strauss, Mrs. Strauss, I've seen you before. I want to be back in New York and Greenwich Village. You're so cool. You're so cool. I want to wear your beanie and just sit and write with you. I first met Marissa on a dating site. I, I switched left, she switched right, and she said, go away and watch some poetry. So I did. And as I said, it's about, it, it's about my history of being a little black British boy. Um, but, and, and their poems, I need to get out of my system. I want to go back to writing about cloud stimuli and the birds and the bees, but I can't get out from my passion. So this was the perfect vehicle. Um, in my book, there's poems about me growing up with race. So there's some angry, there's some tearful. And the first time ever I wrote about me being stabbed. That's Shane's fault. Um, but, and, and there's hope, but there's also lots of poems will sort of reflect um, me when I, when I went to New York, when I've been around America and the whole thing. But as it's Mother's Day in, in England, is it Mother's Day in over in the US? No, anyway, I decided to do um, poems about what well, in the book. Oh yeah, it's called Go From The Bee From A Bang. And all you wonder what that mean. I used to be a national track and field coach. And actually, without even looking at this adonis of a body, I used to be a national champion. But, and, and we always, it, my coach always say, when you get down to on your marks, I say, go from the big of the bang. So it's a bit of a play on the words that I'm talking about race, because that's the race of going from the big of the bang. Now I'm gonna do, God, I look hot. Liz, little Liz from North Carolina. I will look how hot I look. Anyway, um, yeah, the the poems is about it. First poem is is Red Medusa. Red Medusa is a is a strong black ex Vogue model poet, and she sums like. And there's something else about I in my activism. We've got a thing called Say It Louder. And what we acknowledge is, is not just that we're looking at unfair about, about issues about race, but I think primarily the unfair, the, the, the sexist, all change, any change, it was woman at the forefront of it. And, and it's, so we've got, we've got to crack two things and that's, um, Right, during this month of March, which is International Women's Month, I've put on, I've got nine events raising money for women with domestic abuse, and I've got one more to go. So, and 
This first person, Red Medusa. A virginal creation. A celestial body. A patriarch of the, of the deities that lends her beauty to the breath of the Garden of Eden. The tributaries of her veins are saturated. Saturated with the treasure chest of the Nile that proclaims open sesame, a guardian of the words that heal the sick. Red Medusa harvests the love of the righteous into a tower of goodness. She nurtures and cultivates legends to be majestic. Those who seek to harm or break the circle of life will remain stone-faced. As mother to a nation, she's approtecting, warding off evil, waving hands in clouds. Her snake mocks, shreds skins, giving nourishment and love. Africans and Queen reigns divinely supreme. The black women and the indigenous women, did you know, have been the world's single use plastic, a waste of commodity. We need a climate change, which will we need some fracking and we make some could send the dick to have no desire. Uh, it is those who have a black monopoly on strange fruit. The black woman steeps on skeletons of green eyed monsters. The twig always swings with strange fruits with bulging eyes squeezing out of their pits back and forth, back and forth. 400 years, 400 years of back and forth, back and forth, every creek, back and forth, back and forth, it's covert, where did you come from, back and forth, back what color is your baby going to be? Back and forth. They fear the twig. They fear, they fear, they fear. They fear. They still fear all the twigs. They fear, they fear breeds hate. A metaphoric change. I hate hate. Cover, institutionalized, indirect, direct, systemic, it's all hate, 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 hate. 400 years of back and forth. Back and forth. She's black, not colored, not plain, not pink, the yellow spots. She's a Le Noir woman, a black woman. Her enemies are the black and white suits in the audience, adored and sexualized by the creditors, bankers and white powder dealers. Immortalized in 2021, not in the Hall of Fame, but in the propaganda corridors, left and right, left and right, succulent. Succulent blood drips in stains. Only illicit drugs kills the pain. To have or not to have children was her only decision. She, she empowered a way to do what is right, not fight, not to fight. Emancipation for the broken twig is never free. Shh, she's never free. Strange fruit still swings from the poplar tree. She swings wary of the monsters, sleeping with her eyes open on top of the flower bed, skimming the dandelions and weeds, skimming the dandelions and weeds. 
skimming the dandelions and weeds, dandelions and weeds, sowing and reaping her seeds, eyes wide shut, swinging, looking for monsters, and wishbones from the skeletons. She's always, she's always on first watch with her skeleton key, cops, pimps, and bankers, cops, pimps, and bankers, Swings wary of the monsters on top of the flower bed, sowing and reaping the seeds. She's always on first watch. Cops, pimps, and bankers. Halt! Who goes there? Looking for the monsters. Friend or foe? For God's sake, it's always foe. It's always foe. Predators and imposters, predators and imposters, taunted and haunted by grey suited members with FBI and LAPD badges. The skeletons of a black woman rises with the sunflower, breaking new ground, shining tall, <laughs> shining tall and bright. <laughs> as they always are, they always are, the black women are always are, the aggressors, they are always are the aggressors. Beware of the white witches, they float, <laughs> yes, the witches float. They annihilate those monsters, they give them tea and jump. The step of wise give them tea and jump, they smile with their bright red lipstick, Mm. They squeeze them until the serpent has run. They run, run, run under the bed of a black woman. They're not called Michelle or Oprah. They're called Harriet, Billy, or Rosa. They're called a sister or a mother. The black woman always sleeps, always, 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 always. Sleep through monsters, hate to hate, face to face, the tackle the monsters daily to face to face. No divine comedy, no dissertation between heaven and hell, predicting mediocrity, black educated scandal women are defined as evil. Seeking redemption, their crime is that they were born a black woman. The clock has struck one. They never win. The swing creeps and the fruit drops. Lady Day, Day is under the spell. It's back and evil. Back and evil. Back and evil. Creep the swing is oil. Black and evil. Now Lady Day is buried. It still swings in the casket. Back and evil, back and evil. No need to swing back in time as a black woman, the black mother, the black sister will still be at the end of the line, waiting for the knock. Who could that be at the door? It's with officer 666 standing at the door with great audacity, he says, your son and your sons has been shot on the floor, dead. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, just around the corner if you want to pick up the bodies. The black woman always sleeps with monsters. Creep the swings, the oil. Black and evil. Now lay the days buried. Lady Days is black and evil. I told you. I did tell you. The black woman never wins. No, 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 no. That's all, folks. Oh God, Gary Huskisson, y'all, 
unmute your mics, please. Give a warm round of applause to our poet, Gary. Yeah. Say it louder, Gary. Say it louder, yeah. <laughs> Here, Nick P. Uh, what Nick up? Poets, poets in the house. Nick P. Nick Paley Lewis. Woo. Part of the next 10 from RGB. Let's go. Sharing the love, y'all. All right. Thank you so much, Gary, for that incredible poem. I, You, you guys are not ready. I'm just saying. Uh, it's uh, going to continue. It's not stopping. We're not stopping this chain. Uh, it's rolling. Uh, we got Hill Hoover next and then Kimberly KMA Anderson. Uh, you are on deck. I just, you're not ready for Hill. I don't know what to tell you about them. They're absolutely awesome. And I'm so glad that they said yes. All right. Hill writes poetry, flash fiction, love letters, tabletop character sheets, and clumsy boot prints all over Middle Tennessee. They are non-binary, geeky, and in love with words, trees, and chili chocolate, which we specialize in New Mexico. Early writings are inspired by their struggles with speech, trauma, and a life declared too taboo to share with anyone. Their spoken word performances include features of Poetry in the Brew, Time to Arrive, The Bloom Stage, and collaborations benefiting LGBT plus youth writing programs. Their bio is on the website. Go to it for their handles. Unmute your mics. Give a warm round of applause to Hill Let's go we ready welcome 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 thank you so much so you need to send me some of that chili chocolate clearly um <laughs> when so, you book ship yes mm -hmm. so my book is called these godforsaken notes and aside from being inspired by all of that stuff that was just said about the reasons I started writing. It was also inspired by a struggle with neurological problems and memory loss that left me writing a whole bunch of notes about my life and reading them every morning, trying to figure out where I live and what's going on and what I need to do. Um, and so I had literally hundreds of pages of notes, including like people I talk to on a regular basis that I needed to remember, places I go, things that need to happen. And I went, you know, I need to start turning this into poetry. That's the thing I'm gonna do. Um, so that's what this is. I also have a section for I'm still in here that is basically all of my other performance poetry that I do because life doesn't stop when you have a health crisis. So I'm going to read you a few of the memory loss poems and then one of my other poems. This first one is called Hope Number One. If you're at home, take a look at the bookcase in the corner of your room. You may not remember now the hands that carved that wood, the love that went into it for a child who loved nothing more than the written word. You may not remember now how few things you have carried into each new version of your life, how you've never been the kind to own your own baby teeth, how the dolls and toy cars alike died terrible ignoble deaths through the years. But take a look at the bookshelf. Choose any book from the bottom right corner. Pick it up and hold it in your hands and tell me, tell yourself if you remember why it held your heart. Was this the book whose eternal battle between good and evil was conclusively altered by the simple compassion of a child? Was this the book whose philosophies ensnared your senses, whose thought processes smelled of engine oil and road dust, of canvas and canned peaches, of burnt circuits and last night's sex? Was this the poet who brought you back to the stage, or perhaps the one who first brought your pen to paper all those decades ago? Did you read this book first in a cave behind a waterfall, at the top of a tree, or the bottom of an entirely non-metaphorical closet? And if you don't know, perhaps give yourself an hour or two to fall in love again. This one is called warning number two. You can't call your mother. I don't know what you remember about her today, but I know that quite often you get the urge to call her up, tell her some small thing that made you think of her. I don't know why it happens. 
I know there were a great many things wrong between you, but also that the smell of coconut reminds you of her sun warm skin, the way you would watch her walk by the riverside or a beach, tug at your own clothes and which you were able to handle that level of nudity or shamelessness. I know that you hear her laugh in your dreams. And when it happens, you're never thinking of the nights that you tried to hide in the smallest spaces in her disparate homes, from men on too many substances, too careless with weapons, hands, or eyes, but rather of ordering appetizers and desserts for dinner, lounging in grass or sand, her red head thrown back and her whole face tilted to the sky to catch the wind. Or sometime, only for her ears, of the moment after the bike stops, when the buzz of it is still vibrating your bones, and the breeze feels like a physical object that has just untwined itself from you. You can't call her, because she died of a heart attack. One day when you yourself were at a different hospital hours away with your own child, it doesn't matter how many years ago it happened, does it? Only that now, once in a while, you'll just want to call her. Maybe to talk about how you finally learned to wear shorts and write fuck you and not for you on your thighs instead of fearing those who look. And I have to tell you that you can't call her because it hurts ever so much worse if you realize it in the moment. Trust me on this one. Hope number two. If there's nothing immediately pressing on your calendar, please consider taking a walk. Consider this, there have been times in your life when you could not stand up for long days or weeks, when you crawled from room to room and could go no further. Stretch your legs, choose a random park on the map and navigate yourself to any of the favorite rocks or meditation spots you have marked there. If you get lost, consider that a blessing as well that the same trails can still surprise you with a beautiful tree, an unexpected artifact of the past, or a desire path you have certainly tread, but are just as certainly meeting for the first time in this moment. I'm going to close with a poem called Kind Advice. And I will warn here, this is a dark poem with some dark themes like corrective rape, suicide, alcoholism, and general homo and transphobia. I was trying to decide which of my like queer poems to include and this was timely for something happening in my life. So kind advice. My cherished confidant has politely requested that I pack up my beautiful, vibrant, messy, ridiculous, difficult life and relocate it all to a closet. That I hand over the rainbow mask, the t-shirt with pride flags emblazoned on D20s, the pink, blue, and white socks, and most of all, the pronoun pins, or rather the pronouns themselves that I learned to choke down girl, lady, woman, miss, ma'am, as if they were medicine with no spoonful of sugar in sight, that I learned to smile wider at the old men who walk behind me to stare at my ass, but politely inform them I'm in a regular old heterosexual relationship, that I in fact get myself a regular old heterosexual monogamous relationship with some guy who may or may not be in the know, may or may not have any idea of the role that he is playing. And I say, how classic, how very retro. But what's really in my head is an image of my father kneeling on a carpet of cigarette butts, loose change and the occasional cockroach, dressed only in zebra print underwear and desperately clutching a bottle of whiskey in his hand as he made me his confidant, confessed to me his sins because he no longer really believed the church had any particular line to God to offer him, but maybe a child's ears would suffice. I think of a woman who sheepishly pulled up the leg of her suit pants to show me that she'd shaved and whispered in wistful tones in a deep, deep voice about how if only she were younger, had only been born somewhere else, maybe she could live as herself instead of hiding these tiny rebellions from the world. I think of a million slashed wrists and mouthfuls of pills, of a phone call from a woman who desperately wanted to say that both of her children left her, left us, left the world for some reason other than her inability to accept them as they were. I think of girls who kissed my lips feverishly by night, girls who also bullied me mercilessly by day, 
women who begged me to crawl into their beds while husbands were away and never understood why I was too good to be anyone's secret. I think of myself, pushed back into the closet door, the sound of locks clicking, of scraping furniture, of everything in the house being moved into place to keep me in my place. And I look at the pile of threats on my screen, the threats on the streets I walk, the memory of hands bruising my thighs as the words, I'll prove to you that you're a woman resound off every wall. And I thank her for the kind advice. Smile into the mirror at the job my roommate did shaving the sides of my hair, put on the pride geek shirt, and walk out into the sunlight because this beautiful, vibrant, messy, ridiculous, difficult life certainly won't fit into my closet anymore. Thank you. I am Jess Till Hoover everywhere if you need to find me. Let's go, you guys. Unmute your mics. Give it up for Hill. Uh, yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Y'all is not stopping. This train, it ain't stopping. Just stamp your damn ticket and get on board the train. It's moving. It's leaving the damn station. And we got these 15 poets. Ah, oh, let's go. Y'all, we're not even halfway done with the list. Uh, if, if you're not uh, completely mesmerized and changed already, uh, you know, listen closer. That's all I can say because these poets are going to change uh, so many things about the world. Uh, and so I'm so excited. Next up, we got Kimberly KMA Anderson from South Africa. Christy Scribbles, you are on deck and then Lantern Carrier. I had like, if you if you don't look around in, in the room right now and look at all these poets, where they're from, what their backgrounds are, what their life experience is, and you don't believe that fate, destiny, God, kismet, whatever you want to call it, had, didn't have a hand in all of us coming together, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, Kimberly Anderson popped into one of my lives on Instagram that I started doing. I started doing lives in September because I was so damn depressed and sad I couldn't get out of bed. And I was like, I need to do something. And I, I'd never done Instagram lives. I didn't know how to do it. I had no idea what the fuck I was doing, uh, but I just started going on the lives and she popped into my live, uh, the same as S, the same as Christy Scribbles. Uh, the, a lot of these poets like <sighs> Steph, Steph makes faces popped in my live. Um, they just, you cross, your lives cross. And I believe it's for a purpose. And I believe that this is uh, one of the reasons that we met is she has changed my life, this poet, and she's going to change the world and I hope she changes yours as well. Uh, Kimberly KMA Anderson is a mixed race poet from South Africa. She found her voice through poetry and started the turning pain into power movement. She speaks of being a mixed race woman in South Africa and takes you on a journey of consciousness and thought. She's a co-founder of hashtag I am poetry Africa, excuse me, hashtag I am poetry underscore Africa, a foundation that helps poets master their craft and heal through poetry. Her love of history influences her writing and tells stories of the ones before us. Please unmute your mics, give a warm round of applause for our next poet, Kimberly KMA Anderson. Kimberly. One of my favorites. Welcome, 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 girl. That's my home girl. Oh, hey, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, that's yep. Cool. <laughs> yeah, we can. Um, we can. We can. Cool. So, if I'm no more, I hope you remember me in silence. How it soothed my soul and birth poetry, words of motivation and tranquility. But if you truly seek for me of I was or what I stand for, I'll be found in the laughter of my daughters. Warmth in every in my teaching, the way they treat my character, and the way they carry themselves. But if you seek for more, wish to know more, my journey of turning pain into power will reveal hidden truths if you read closely between the lines. That is the first poem that's going to be in my book. <laughs> that is um, 
I think the shortest piece I've written in my life. Um, <laughs> and um, firstly, I just want to say San Bonani Nonke. Um, my name is Kimberly K. May Anderson. Um, and poetry has been a very, <laughs> I've had a love-hate relationship with poetry for quite some time because I didn't know who I was um, within my finding my identity as a poet. But once I found my identity as a poet, um, which started by me writing about myself. And I feel like writing about yourself is like the most exposing thing that you can do because you're gonna write about your flaws and your failures and so many different things. So within my journey of writing about myself, um, I was like, oh, okay, let me write about my experiences of being mixed race in South Africa. And uh, it was funny enough because I didn't face any challenges much. Uh, the fact that people would ties that to my hair length and so on and so forth, but it didn't bother me much. Um, but when I moved out to Johannesburg, it was crazy because people would walk up to me and start speaking Afrikaans. Uh, <laughs> and they still do, but I don't speak Afrikaans. So I, I went on to write this piece called A Colored Girl's Tale. And I always say if I um, had to leave the earth tomorrow and I'm only known by that specific poem, I would have achieved a lot in life. <laughs> um, this is a colored girl. I'm not white, neither am I black. Even though my taste of men has always been darker than my fair skin, my eyes are brown, my hair curly, not straight. Races, but my face was the one that they created. My nose is too round and my ears are too pointy. The language I'm supposed to understand sounds so foreign to me, so I, I give off this blank look when Afrikaans is thrown at me, leaving them to try and add up the matters to how, what, you see, I'm just your untypical color chick. And a swear word is the furthest thing in my dictionary and straightening my hair seems to have gotten lost somewhere in history. I'm not a massacre chick. I'm more like a saubo and a gunjani type of chick. I'm not, a, I'm not a colored girl on the edge. I'm more like the quiet one in the corner with my nose in a book, hoping to go unseen in case you might make that mistake and want to put me on your stereotypical plate. See, but it's worse when they see me with my kids. That look of confusion tied up in all those unanswered questions. And just to show them I can hear their very thoughts, I always give them that smile, like, you'll be OK. You see, sometimes I don't even understand what I am. But I've learned to embrace my pop and tribe eating, big thighs, brown eyes, bushy hair, round nose, Zeus, rejecting self. How my story has people puzzling for days. I've been called them bushy and coy i am neither one of these things i am a mixed race beauty my ancestors got killed for looking like me from village to village they came on horses they rode trying to get rid of what they called a crime and some born the right color with the right hair strand got to pass the pencil test a bonus was that they embraced the language that was forced upon them and centuries later and here i am not fitting in but proud to stand out they say I have no culture, and I've also found that non because <laughs> I think we walk on the road with stockings on our heads. Have they think we all walk on the road with stockings on our heads? Teens, <laughs> sorry, people <laughs> here. They think we all walk on the road with stockings on our heads as, and have babies as teenagers, drink black label, fight with beer bottles and okapis. Stop putting me in all your colored girls are going to hit you with pots and pans box. See, I love hearing you talk about me in a taxi or saying, Umuhle, with hope of me not understanding. But what I cherish more is that look on your face. After I reply with that one question always asked, Upumapi. See, I could go on to, to tell you about how I come from the small farming town, how I stole sugarcane as a kid, ran around without any shoes and have this brown dog follow me at all times without a leash. And I'm not your typical color chick. All right, so <laughs> that piece kind of packs, <laughs> packs a lot of things all in one. But um, I like to think of it as my signature piece. That's my identity. That's who I am. I'm not an African speaking colored person as per what a colored person is supposed to speak, which is Afrikaans, which was a, a whole nother story. Um, and the book is just packed with my experiences of being a colored woman in South Africa. As I said, not your typical colored woman in South Africa, but also speaking on the history of 
Africa as well. And I know history is always a painful thing that people want to try and avoid at times, but we in this room, we're making history right now. This is a historical moment. This is recorded, it's put somewhere. In the next five years from now, people are gonna see it. In the next two hours from now, somebody's gonna see it. So we are in a moment where we're creating history. And I feel like with the book as well, it's something, as I say, it's gonna outlive who I am. The, big, the book is bigger than I am. Um, I thought I was a girl, but the book is way bigger than I am. Um, so, how much, how much time do I have, Marissa? <laughs> you have... Dun, dun, dun. Oh, yeah, you've got like four more minutes at least. Ooh, okay. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to... This was a piece that was supposed to go in the book. I'm still unsure if I'm going to put it in or not. <laughs> Um, this is a very, very new piece. Uh, right, I'll close off with this one. I'm so tired of only being the beauty you see and not what's deep inside of me. I'm so tired of always trying to prove my worth to validate my place on this earth. See, I'm so tired of seeing the face one so cheaply priced, yet the land I call home holds gems. Yet the land I call home holds gems. You see, my figure is something to admire. And I have curves that hold dimensions that demand attention with every slight sway made perfectly chiseled by angels. And Sarah Bachman was a name to remember and is to remember a breed so rare they needed to display across foreign seas, torturing their wives with her exotic physique they could only mimic with plastic surgery. So they mocked her for being the African beauty that their men lusted over. They called her a subject of scientific research, but you can call her Venus. I don't think you understand the burdens women face throughout history. You see, when Nina Simone wrote for a poetic version or something like this my skin is fair and my lips sweet thing you will ever take an abomination to the white race nation a seed planted while in shackles to a woman whose name was stripped from her so they her name tongues may have produced whoops and instruments of infliction but never pronunciation a name of power and pride, a constant reminder of her royalty. They tried to ransack like the tombstones of Makongubwe Utembisile. Utembisile, an African name that she wore with pride, and her skin matches the richness of this African soil. I am so tired of being classed as beautiful only because of my skin color. As if the beauty I hold within means nothing and my soul exhausted from carrying the weight of this I'm constantly, constantly trying to prove that I am beyond this God-given shell. <laughs> I'm so tired of... I'm so tired of only being the beauty you see and not what's deep inside of me. I'm so tired of always trying to prove my worth to validate my place on this earth. Thank you very much, everyone. You guys, unmute Amazing. your mics. Give it up for oh, Kimberly. Yeah. Yeah. Kimberly. Wow. Ah, amazing, gorgeous, yeah. amazing, amazing work. Uh, you know what I mean, <laughs> man, these poets, they have been such a blessing in my life. I hope that they are such a blessing in yours as well. Uh, and, and I hope that, um, that, that blessing is lifelong. I hope they're always in my life and I'm always in theirs and they're always in yours. All right, next up, like, we did not stop. Chrissy Scribbles is up next. Like, there's no way to prepare for this poet. Uh, she has blessed my mic. She has blessed my life. Uh, I am so excited. Uh, she co-hosts with me on uh, the Great Debaters show that we do the second Friday night of the month at The Word is Right. 
which is just so much fun. And I'm just, I'm so elated to be, uh, to be doing her book. So here we go. Let me pull her bio up. Christy Scribbles is a poet from West Virginia living in upstate New York. She believes in the power of words, the transmutation through art and the power within it. She uses art to advocate for change and equality. Christy is a lover of everything outdoors and draws inspiration from the nature around her. She has found a community within the poetry and has found poetry within the community. Please unmute your mics, give a warm welcome to the poetry alchemist, Christy Scribbles. Yeah, Christy. Woo. Christy, Woo. Christy, welcome. So good to be here. Um, the poetry has blown me away so far. So um, I just love being a part of this group. Um, I am the poetry alchemist on Instagram. That's where you will find me. And that's where you'll find my book soon enough to pre-order. Um, I, the title of my book is Channeling Moons. I channeled this book from the new moon in February to the new moon in March. And um, here we go. The introduction of me. I am a girl from West Virginia, a West Virginia girl, a small town girl, a tomboy girl who always felt disconnected always felt different, always felt everything. Everything was felt, feelings surrounded me. The feelings of plants and animals and people. I was a girl who didn't know, didn't understand it all, didn't understand the connection to me and everything around me. The empathic nature of myself led me down many rocky paths, many late nights trying to drown out the feelings, trying to not give in to the sadness. Sometimes it wasn't even mine, but I didn't know that then. I understand that now. It's not all mine. I ground now and clear my energy and meditate and release and work through. Energy is all around us, around you. Working with energy has grounded me, changed my perspective, much like my words have. I am a poet. I am a mother, a stay-at-home mother from upstate New York. I found poetry through healing, through pain, through a spiritual awakening. It awakened my words and the channel of me came through me and the words started to flow and my channel started to open and the, po and the poet inside was let out and the person inside forever changed. I found myself again through my words and the power they had to change, to heal, to transmute, to connect through a poetry community, through the poet's hearts around me, the hearts of my people, who feel just as much as me, who pain just as much as me, who want to change just as much as me. This is as much for them as it is for me because an underground community of poets, of artists, of writers, of singers, of activists, of renegades, of protesters, of radical thinkers, of rule breakers, and history changers, and earth savers, and systems annihilators, they matter. We matter, our work matters, and in this community of writers and spoken word artists who I've come across, who have come across my screen, they led me here, led me here writing this, and they give me hope, and they give me a voice, a place to be heard, to be seen, to be a poet, a place to be a poet, what a glorious thing, to poet, to poem, to write, to passion, to freedom. What a glorious thing. I call in this book. I call in this space. I call in this moon, this new moon in Aquarius, in the sky within my soul, connected at birth from the place where you hung above me as I embarked to this portal of existence, this space in the universe, this speck that is me. With this spark of divinity, I sit and I write, I sit and I type, and I call in this book experimental voyage to the channel of me, the channel inside me, that place deep inside me where the words, they whisper, they whisper my name and sweat to my palm to be written, to be shared. They just want to be shared and remembered and seen, seen sitting in cross leg, meditation mat below as I rock to and fro and breath and breathe to remember the breath is the wind and the life 
force we have and meditation that holds me many sessions of connect and many worlds are they traveled as i sit and i soar i sit and i hurt i sit and i heal and i cry and i cry an exclamation point applying all of this upon this bumpy old mat the journey of my mat my meditation mat, my meditation like format of this whole fucking book. What will it be? What will she say? What will I say? What have I said already? Mary J pops in to say hi, waves you all hello. What will she say? What will I say? What have I said already? And I feel the new moon wanting to be named and honored because she is the star of this book. Her newness gave me the idea to channel this vision in this book that I write, Channeling Moons, 30 Days of My Life. My journey, my mind, my heart, my soul, my book. I call in my book. I call in my book. I call in this book. May it heal. May it hold. May it release. May it journey. May it find. May it fly. May it be. May it be. May it be. To my art to my voice, to my words, to my creativity. I want you to know something. I want you to know I will not, I will try not to put you in that box. I will try not to surround you in the systems, in the systems of oppression, of capitalism, of production. I will not produce you. I will allow you. I will allow you to be what you want to be. I don't need you to be anything more, more than anything you are upon this screen that I type on. You are allowed to be just because, just because you help me. You help me to see me and the inner world of me and the inner heart of me and the inner pain of me. You allow me to be seen, to be heard, to be connected to the magic within the art, within these words, within my voice, my voice and the voice of all artists, of all creators, of all the thinkers. I want you to know, you don't have to be what they want you to be. You don't have to make money for me. You don't have to produce for me, for them. Don't produce for them. Don't exist for them. Don't create for them. Exist for you, create for you, be free for you. I break free for you. I break free every day that I see the systems and how they play up against one another, how they trick us to believe that art isn't alive, isn't breathing, isn't crucial. It isn't a part of their world. They can't see you. They can't see what I see. I see the power in you, the life changing in you, the world rearranging in you, the healing in art, the joy in art. I see what you see. I see the set free of it all as it moves through my body and onto the page and onto the screen and into the sound, the waves around us as we share our art with each other, our stories with each other. We share our magic with each other. This is where the true healing lies within the art of all humans. The baking the cooking, the making, the sewing, the gardening, the dancing, the flowering, the weaving, the typing, the sculpting, the singing, the playing, the making, the believing, the receiving of creating, of art, of love, of change, of understanding, of working and bleeding and revolting and resisting and releasing and releasing and releasing, releasing you, releasing you, releasing you from that box, from that box, from that box, from those boxes, from all boxes. No more boxes. No more boxes. No more boxes. Thank you. God damn, Christy Scrum. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. Woo. Oh. oh my God. Did you have another one, my dear? Or are you done? I don't want to cut you off if you had another one. Okay. Y'all unmute your mics, please. Give it up for Christy Scribbles. Oh, hey, Christy. Oh, my God. Absolutely sensational. Oh, the, there's so much love in the comments for you guys. So please read the comments. Um, just take it all in, right? big breath take it all in you are part of this launch yes 
It's really happening. You're part of all these poets. And it's not stopping because we have Lantern Carrier up next. Lantern Carriers is purely one of the most um, authentic and um, very giving, very generous poets I've ever met. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to be publishing him alongside all of you because uh, it, it wouldn't be the same without any of you on this launch, right? I mean, we don't know who's going to be here until they're here. And then looking back, you're like, wow, I don't know how I would do it with any of you not here. Uh, so thank you, Lantern, for being part of this. Uh, the Lantern Carrier is a creative writer and author born in Grenada, West Indies, now lives in London. He grew up writing poetry, but switched to inspirational and metaphysical poetry when he took up the meditative life. Lantern Carrier has won multiple slam competitions with performance pieces, as well as making the finals in the h &T National Final in Brighton. Lantern Carrier brings light through his work. His ability to weave words is unique, his focus being the uplifting, lofty, and sublime. Please unmute your mics, give a warm round of applause for our next poet, Lantern Carrier! Yes, Lantern. I bow to you, Marisa Prada. Welcome, I'll, give a I'll give a shout out to my man, Gary, as well, because he gave one to me. <laughs> the spirit of the word for Mother and Sunday. If you should find me script in eloquent bars, know that my thoughts ascend on clouds of the eternal. I open my heart to the world of the spirit like roses do to lovers with aromas of sacrifice and light. When the white magnolias unfurl to the magic of spring, I would whisper the songs of Solomon in your soul, make my tongue an artist, a connoisseur for David's psalms, even while reaching out to the healing rays of the invisible to calm the disquiet of your concerns. I am love's music, resonating the chords of her lute to all who seek the soothing rays of the sun, those finding the time to open the Venetian blinds, blinds of the inner temple to allow its nourishing and streaming beams to blend its radiance into the citadel of the heart's joy. When I say that I love you, send you hugs, I wish you a happy mother in Sunday, Know that I'm thinking of you as queens and kings, daughters and sons of a nameless pearl and spoken, one with such bewildering beauty that I yearn to become absorbed in its flames of fire, its intoxicating wine. Rejoice. You are a significant note in the orchestra of sacred rhythms, playing your part like a piano among diverse instruments in order to merge into an enchanting symphony. A malleable clay in the expert hands of the master weaver, knowing that one day you'll display the finest flowers for which you were masterfully designed. Poem one. Let me go back to the main screen. Good. I wish I could feel now what I felt then. You and I, hand in hand, picking winter sweet clematis, caressing the unseen purple of the redolence on our breaths, throwing snowballs to infinitude. I wish I could feel now what I felt then. Your smile painting its magical garlands on my gaze, my hopes and dreams blossoming like radiant lotuses, Nature's sunsets alluring my being with their enchantments. I wish I could feel now what I felt then. Heart singing sweetly in the meadow of bliss. My soul bird dancing on the golden robes of moonlight, cradling my longing with speechless rhapsodies. I wish I could feel now what I felt then. Your love like an arrow piercing into my spirit, a bewildering and wondrous wine intoxing my soul with the ecstasy of joy. Yet, even as my brush longs to stroke the past, I can only admire the sacrament of the present moment. Dawn is fast approaching. The beloved is playing with each moment in accordance with his dreams. 
poem three. You hold my gaze above the crimson red of the setting sun. Beneath the shade of the peony blossoms, the spring wind augments the intimacy of hearts clasped together in deep serenity. I long to blend in you the way scent blends in flowers, cascading a redolence to my breath, serving to remind me of your astonishing beauty. I remain captivated, the stars shooting silently like fireflies as the nocturnal hue enters. The blue moon dances with the grace of celestial nymphs. I flow with a luster, flooding the very fabric of my soul. You hold my gaze amidst the Andromeda glitter of heaven. My heart is bemused by a plethora of grandeur, stabbing its core with shimmering lights. Next poem. Many times did death swallow my breath, shattering dreams of millennia. Inhaling the kernels of sweet sacrifice, I ascended my night of shadows, gliding on silvery robes of tomorrows. My mood elevated, the hot pool at the fire and crimson skies, riding the crest of rainbows and sunsets. A songbird searching through eons for its beloved, I soared upwards like a fiery phoenix in flight. Oh, love, you hid in the weeping thorns of my sorrows, illumined the rose of my fervent desires. My storm of attachments now transformed. I sail a mariner unanchored, adrift on the golden wings of light. I now sing on the Elysian harp of symphonies, echoing the drums of the new Jerusalem. Shakespearean sonnet. Unspoken speechless, thy immortal bliss, birthless, deathless, beyond eternal time. In my abyss, O oh, sweet effulgent kiss, peerless are the cadences of your chime. All where you burn, thou great supernal fire, so muchless is the joy of thy delight. Dousing the flames of darkness and desire, replacing them with your resplendent light. No one doth speak who looks upon thy face. Unworthy now is speech and so denied. A Sierra rose, your paragon of grace. A soundless music now in you abide. Within, without, around, below, above, in trance intoxicated with thy love. Love stroked my heart with the light of beauty. Kiss my soul with the joy of solitude. I awoke from the turmoil of endless duty to the sweet ecstasy of, to the sweet serenity of ecstasy's mood. More a merciful boon than one of effort, I cup my hands as the glimmer unfurls, bedecking me in a bouquet of magnificence, awake to her grandeur and peerless curls. A monarch once lost in the grip of desire, aimlessly wading through deathless time, spinning on the endless cogs of samsara, bleeding with tears to resolve my crimes. Now my speech is unspoken, my tongue becomes mute, absorbed in the wine of your ancient truth. An observational piece. Uh, Okay. The pool in its profundity was serene, calm, peaceful, like ascending love. Its glistening beauty held my gaze, freeing the mind from its earthly strife. The translucent light of the scattering clouds whispered softly to an inquiring heart, delving deeper into this kiss of light. The sweet melody of starlings befriend me as the light winds and foliage hug my spirit. I look at the exquisitely knitted braids of the Chinese girl in charmed offensive, tugging at her eloquence and allure. Amitofa, I said, she smiled. Beneath a green canopy in the garden terrace, I grow garlands in my soul 
from the ecology of this magnificent setting. The sun shimmering rays dance with the ripples. My breath spins with a renewed energy, quickening the soul with delight. <laughs> Thank you. Last one, Revelations. Mesmerized by the breaking of waves, I listened to the symphony of the wind, of how she spoke of time past and whispering dreams of the pain of millennial sorrows, the tenderness of love. I lay on the beauty of twilight, enchanted by the light of perennial entities, which kissed my heart. The night sky fixated my gaze. We danced on the crest of rolling tides as the wind continued her illumining conversations. She spoke of the magic of smiles, of the miracle of sunrise, and the moon kissed my soul as I bowed in sacred gratitude. She sang of the glory of man, of the undaunted, undaunted courage of a woman's sacrifice, and my heart became a field of prayer. She talked of life struggles, of how light shines in Jerusalem, even when the shadows are dense, that we can only measure the darkness by an effulgence we once knew. And I listened, and my tears became a raiment for the beloved. Have wine, she says. She said, go forth and love, for are not your desires the same adversity that will fashion you into gold? And how shall you laugh? If you know no weeping, be patient, for the weaving of the inner alchemist never ceases. She spins and spins a zillion revolutions until every indiscretion is wiped clean and the yarn returns to the state of grandeur. You are that yarn, you are that grandeur. Even though you may not feel it, I can see a trillion candles glittering in your coal. Then the wave subsided and the wind blew softly, gently caressing my spirit. The fire of my essence burned with the setting sun. Fear not, she said, before becoming silent. I am with you always, even onto the edge of eternal time. Lantern Carrier, thank you. Oh man, you guys unmute your mics. Give it up for Lantern Carrier. Lantern. Oh, lantern oh, one, dope one, dope one. Was amazing. Hey. Ah, oh, that was so For real, for real. Oh <laughs> man. <laughs> Let's hey. go. Like I said, their bios are on the website. You can go there to find their links, their handles, all the good stuff. Find them on social media. Plug in at Red or Green Books and the word is right. Uh, there are many of these poets who have had features or are going to be having features in the near future here. Word is right. Uh, and, and if they've already had their features, their bios and everything will also be on those past event pages. All right. The tiny switch up in the list tonight, uh, today. Anthony, are you reading? I know you're here. My friend, you're probably in the car driving, working. Would you like to read? Just got off of work. Yes, I would. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go Patti. We'll yes. let Patti read now, and then I'll bring you up, okay? And then if Maureen is ready, then we'll bring Maureen, S, Stephanie, uh, Terry Rose. And if Thomas um, is able to get here, then he can wrap us up tonight. All right. So um, I have had the privilege uh, to meet Patti in person. I am such a fan of hers. I was so excited when I heard her poetry. I, I met her on um, Barbed Wire Open Mic Series. Richie Marufo runs out of, out of El Paso, Texas, uh, Monday nights. And uh, I know Poe Con does a lot of stuff with BWAMs as well. So uh, yes, El Paso, Texas has so much, uh, so much going on for poetry. And now I get to publish her book. Um, so let me read your let me read your bio, Patti, and uh, and you, you can take it away. All right, hang on, because we got noise. Let me get some noise. Uh, there we go. All right, Patti Orozco began writing when all spoken words had failed her. Patti fell in love with poetry through the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Poet to poet, he became her reason why written words were necessary. Her writing began in middle school, and although there has been, uh, there, 
It, there's been absent years in between without a writer's presence within her. Patti has rekindled her love for poetry once again. Rooted in El Paso, Texas, she has appeared on both online and in-person open mics. Please unmute yourself. Give it up for our next poet, Patti Orozco. Welcome, 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 welcome. For real, for real. Okay, hi. Betty. <laughs> Hello. So Snap, sorry, hang on, Patti. I mean I was muting everyone and I accidentally clicked your mute. So go unmute real quick. I'm sorry. That? Okay. I tried to script my introduction. I tried to write a poem for a poem. I just want to say a little bit about the book really quick. I did want to write a poem for the sad, for the lonely, for the broken, for the healing. I wanted to write a book that you wanted to grab on your dark days where you felt absolutely alone. I wanted you to know that at least someone was there in the presence of a book. So I'm just gonna read a few pieces really quick. I tried speaking without poetry, kept fumbling without the safety of metaphors and space stanzas. Try telling my story without the rhythm of typing behind it. Not one single soul could hear me. I hide behind the pages of a book, not yet my own. Respond questions with facts about the weather, tell lies about the feelings. I wrote a poem today in silence. Heard the water boiling within me, spilled myself into a living room floor, cried without tearing. I tried speaking without poetry, but the voice within the voice without pencil shavings is unable, is trembling without shaking, is run on sentences with no sense, is messy. It's calming the anxiety, asking for permission to speak first before it, pretending smiles aren't upside down frowns. And those same words written on paper are called poetry. Okay, that's one piece. And then this is another one. I am unaware if I exist or not. Sometimes I lay on the floor and hope the vibrations of the extending of my chest is enough. I wonder if they're louder than the tiptoeing of the weight of my soul on fractured knees. Wonder if I'm staggered breathing takes the life of blooming lilies. Sometimes I catch myself waving my limbs in the direction of my sight. Wonder if the dust will ever clear from the backdrop of life. Wonder if I'll be able to see without the shadows of shutters. I wonder how many times I've died when my heart stopped feeling, stopped strumming the lyrics to a scratch CD. I can't count the number of times I've outspoken my mind. Can't win a race when I'm still trying to tie my shoes. I won't find my name in the phone book, won't see the mud on my sneakers. If you asked me the time, I would tell you. The time I was born for the first gasp was the only time I truly filled my lungs with air. I'm quite unsure of how really here I am. I once poked myself with a toothpick thinking I had something in me that didn't belong. Once wore a cast on my legs to try to fit the direction of wrong that kept leading me right back to the beginning. Once stayed awake during a dream just to know what magic actually meant. Once stood at the ledge of my bed and wondered if this was the greatest height my shoulders would know. I see the reflection in the mirror but she doesn't quite resemble who I really am. I'm not even sure of who she really is. I stopped counting the days in a month when each night kept overlapping with the sound of a rooster croaking. The hens stopped henning, the cows stopped cowing, the day stopped daying. Sometimes I hold up a glass to my nostrils, wait for the fog to roll in, and then fill it with vodka and drink from it. And then keeping in line with the depressing and the sad. What I really want is to be lost in a moment where sadness doesn't creep between the ridges of my fingertips. Where the strings attached to my soul aren't being yanked to the support of the ground. A moment where my heart doesn't feel like crumbling from the weight of my chest caving in. I want happiness to be the one invited guest who lingers past the bend of the moon. Who tickles the seams of my limbs and provides the gusts beneath my feet. 
What I want is a moment in which I don't feel as if I'm being punched in my face with undeniable sadness, where I don't feel like I'm falling completely apart. I don't want potions or spells for the trickery of bliss and the delusion of crawling away beneath the darkness of the covers only to be found between weighted sheets disguised as silk linens. To hold on to the belief of tomorrow without the existence of today. To believe of who I am and not what I am, for what I am is just sadness. Simply undone that doesn't do living, hardly even does breathing, hardly knows how to be human. I've stumbled upon these words more times than not, practiced them in front of the bathroom mirror, made the same mistakes over and over and over again. See, I'm living, but I'm truly not actually living. Making each day to noon and then never made it past the hill and then here. Here is where I stopped the poem when things got a bit tad too real. Okay, I think that's everything. Yes, Patti Orozco! You guys unmute your mics, Ooh. give it up. Yeah. Oh, hey, Patty. Woo. Awesome. Patty, Patty. Let's go. I'm so excited. Um, I can't wait. I <laughs> like, I'm like a little kid, and it's Christmas every day. Um, I get to see these books come to life and the artwork, and and just oh my god, it's so exciting. I love, love, love it. All right. Um, Anthony, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right, let me read Anthony's uh, bio real quick. We'll bring him up, and then Maureen, if you're if you're ready after um, after Anthony, let me know. If not, then I'll bring S up, and uh, let's keep going. It's not stopping here, right? And I'm super excited that Anthony is part of the Word Is Right family. He's going to be having a show um, on a certain Thursdays every month if, that is uh, geared around mental health awareness. We're super excited to have him. Uh, let's go. His book is a collaboration with him and his son, C.D. McClendon, and their book is a collection of love poems for their wives. I'm just putting that in there, and I'll let him talk about his book. All right. <clears throat> Anthony Harris, MD Live, is a storyteller, author, and poet since age six. MD is not only a member of Word is Right, but he is also a member of Faces of Poetry, Souls of Poetry Lounge, Drop the Mic, Drip the Mic, Poemology, and Drip the Mic Hotel. He is a veteran of poetry and always seeks to stretch his pen. MD is a native of Dallas, Texas. He is a conscious writer who envelops you into a world of hurt, pain, and the triumph through it all. Please unmute your mics, give a warm round of applause to our next poet, Anthony Harris, MD Live. Woo uh, finally was able to jump in been at work all day so i'm finally able to jump in and i wanted to share a few pieces uh, from my son and myself um, this first piece is called god's design the world was designed so that everyone had someone to love and I could have traveled the widest sea. I could have climbed the highest mountain. I could have walked for miles and miles to find that one true love that was meant just for me, but that wasn't God's design. The world was designed so that everyone had a special shoulder to pry on and I could have leaned on my friend for comfort. I could have screamed out for someone to listen I could have sheltered myself in and held it because I felt alone in this world, but that wasn't God's plan. The world was designed for love and compassion. I needed that to survive and I needed you. It wasn't by coincidence that we met at that place on that day and at that time. God knew we needed each other to survive. We needed each other so that we can carry on. And meeting you was truly by his design. That was a piece uh, by my son. And this is also a piece uh, written by my son. 
is called the essence of you. The essence of you says never to lower your head. It's a sign of brokenness. And you, my queen, are not broken. Never think of a glass, glass half full because within you, there is no emptiness. Pride yourself in the way you walk, in the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, because there is only one you. Distinguish yourself within your own self so that, <clears throat> that you are a melanated queen dipped in chocolate and honey. Your aura is surrounded with the colors of success because failure is not an option. Remember, you are descendant of royalty and queens before you have given so much so that the beauty that exudes from within your soul is passed down to the souls of your children. Queens before you also have died so that you can live. So now it's your turn. Rise up and walk with pride for you are the phenomenal woman Maya Angelou wrote about. You are the true version of Cleopatra that is never talked about. You are the very essence of womanhood. Take your seat at the head of the table and be crowned because the essence of you says to never lower your head. That's a sign of brokenness and you my queen will never be broken. Uh, got another one. Um, this one uh, is called Shattered Hearts. And all of these will be in my uh, book of poetry that me and my son has written. Um, this one is called Shattered Hearts. As soon as I can pull it up. Okay. She, this beautiful queen, had the most pleasant smile. It captures the soul. And she had eyes that had a story waiting to be told. I, a man lost, just hoping to be found. We met on a moonless night, yet our stars were aligned. We sat and talked for hours, shared stories of our past, and somehow still found a way to make each other laugh. We learned that we both had shattered hearts and just wanted someone to mend the broken parts. We walked away knowing we had made a new friend and made plans on meeting again. Time went on and our hearts grew strong. We became each other's backbone. She helped me to realize my dreams and how to succeed. I showed her that I loved her. I promised to first, never to forsake her and never to leave. We learned that together we can mend our shattered hearts and make them whole again. Okay, and one more. Uh, so, and, this one is one from me also, and it's called, Where Did You Come From? You appeared out of nowhere, sharing your love with a bitter soul, giving unto me a chance to be free, to be free of my demons that plague me, to be free of, a dr of drowning in a despairing sea. You chose me as the one to wrap your arms around, and speak the words I've longed to hear. You chose me as the one to, to be the receiver of your heart. But where did you come from? I never thought a woman so refined could love a heart like mine. But here you are, sharing with me all the love you got, giving of yourself when I don't have anything to offer. I was a wounded soul, locked in the shell of my former self, and you set me free, free to be worthy of the love you're giving me. But again, I ask, where did you come from? Heaven, in peace.
Oh man, you guys unmute your mics. Give it up for MD Live, Anthony Ooh. Harris. Let's go, let's go. Amazing trip. Yeah. Oh, man. Woo. Wow. MD Woo. Yeah. Woo. Yes, AD Harris, Anthony Harris, and CD McClendon, father son duo, uh, putting together a book of poetry, love poems for their wives. Uh, it is absolutely a sensational concept. I love it. Let's go. Um, all right. Uh, Maureen Medina is next. I am so super stoked for this poet. Uh, she is between New York City and Portugal, so it gives all of us a reason to go across the pond uh, and just will stay with all of these wonderful international poets and go experience where they live. Um, I'm very, very excited for Maureen. She blew me away at the Norican Poets Cafe. And when I found out she didn't have a book, I was like, oh my God, we need to do your book. Uh, so I'm so glad that she joined us to make us the Fierce 15, as she likes to say, the Fierce 15. Uh, and uh, I'll read her quick bio. Uh, Maureen Medina is the founder of Leave in Peace and a campaign, a campaign strategist and organizer for Slaughter Free NYC. She advocates for both human and non-human animals and asserts that all oppression is connected. In alignment with the idea that none of us are free unless all of us are free, Maureen hopes to inspire the pursuit of co uh, collective liberation through writing. You can go to the website to find her links and her bios. Unmute your mics, give it up for Maureen Medina. Medina. Yes. Woo. Welcome, 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 girl. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Marissa, for hosting, for hearing me. Um, it really means so much. Can you hear me? Okay. So this first poem was inspired by the shootings in Atlanta. Um, I've never felt connected to my roots as a Filipino, as an Asian, but something about these shootings just hit me. So this first piece is called Happy Ending. Happy ending. Is that what you came for when you sought my people out because you had a bad day? Fetishizing my existence and eliminating me simply because you couldn't control yourself? Your white supremacy cannot be contained. Shots fired, hatred in every bullet, yet we've died many times before. When you came to our countries uninvited, our beds unsolicited, our cultures that you appropriated and then sold to us as a sign that you were here. Children were born from a lack of protection. Colonization, is that a justification or an ultimatum? You forced us into your melting pot, watching all the colors become one, dividing us with a gradient. White is right, but yellow is the next best thing. Stand back, tiger mom. She vilifies blackness as though it's dirty ugly, but black lives matter and they are beautiful. We are beautiful. And no, brown is not lesser than, brown is not illegal, brown is not lazy. We are brown too. And we work hard, we provide for our own and we stop. Tiger mom won't have any of it. We are not them, she says. We earned our way. Good at math, straight A's, straight hair, typecast, though we are black and we are brown and we are indigenous. We are every single color, texture and blessing. We are not a monolith and we are storytellers if we believe the myth of the model minority. Hey, how do Asians name their kids? Just drop a bunch of silverware down the stairs and listen to the sounds they make. Ching, chong, chink, gook. We are the punchline, but we respond with obedience loyal to the monster that mocks chinky eyes and seeks the crease in our eyelids without ever questioning how a colorful society can brim with oppression and individual suppression, or how a colorblind society overlooks what it won't put a name to. White supremacy, racism, xenophobia. How can we call them strangers when we have all met before? Hate crimes, all different iterations of the same sentiment that we are other, we are less than, and we are stained by color. 
distorted by your concentration camps, cheap labor and conditioning, you pit us against each other and run away without incident. You loathe all things foreign, yet call us essential while you try to erase us. We adjust and adjust our assimilation irrelevant to your contempt for all things made in China. Well, the whole world is watching and they know what you have done. They see who you are. They know that you, you have thrived from our stolen freedom and you are not a disease. You are not the exception. You are not a mental health issue. You are not a disability. You are not a broken childhood and you are not a bad day. You are our friend, lover, spouse, neighbor, sister, brother, nurse, doctor, lawyer, judge, and jury, and you are the problem. You are violence perpetuated. You are the stigma, and you, you misogynist, white supremacist, colonizer, oppressor, racist, terrorist, you, you were made in America. So that was the first poem, thank you. Um, I forgot to say that my book is called um, My Fears Out Loud because I was um, born and raised uh, in fear, essentially. And it used to be something I resisted until I decided I was tired and I decided to befriend it. And um, so this is all a summation of of all that I've observed and witnessed and been complicit in and that I'm fighting against. So um, here is my next one. One second. <clears throat> this one is called Love in War. If someone asks you where you've been, tell them you've been battling your demons and you're winning. They say all is fair in love and war, but what if the war is loving yourself? What if you are your own enemy, captor and savior? Is it fair then? And how do you tip the scales in your favor? Prisoner of war, how do you call a truce when the army of self-doubt flanks you? when trust your only armor has fallen and when clarity your weapon is lost on the battlefield? How do you quell the rebellion of an unforgiving self? Which wolf gets fed and which one starves? Wave the white flag, but be merciful in your surrender. Fear is embedded like shrapnel, but it can't have you. Your demise is not in your defeat and your greatest feat is fighting at all. The war wages on, but as long as you're in it, you're winning. So that's the second piece. Um, do I have time for one more? Yes. Okay. Um, one second, where did it go? And this one is, um, it's called These Hands. It's one of my favorite that hurts me the most every time I read or perform it. It's a tribute to Slaughterhouse Rivers and it's called These Hands. <clears throat> These hands of mine, what are they good for? Gentle enough to braid my child's hair, tender enough to caress my partner, strong enough to provide for my family. But these treacherous hands betray my soul. These hands are providers. My loved ones rely on them, not knowing what they have done, what they do every single day. They don't know how these mangled hands take lives just to sustain ours. They don't know that these hands, though washed so many times, will never be clean. They will never be absolved. Not even addiction can make me forget. These broken hands of mine make for a broken home. 
an unforgiving system that hates who I am, but preys on the power of my hands. What else can I do? Given neither flowers nor skill, these guilty hands are paid to destroy, and I am a casualty. My family is a casualty. The ugliness to which my hands were complicit has cost me, us, peace. These hands pray for atonement for what they've done, but not even prayer can bring the dead back to life. These hands, assassins. These hands hold children fragile and full of promise in one hand and darkness in the other. The only promise is hurt for all of us. Some fight until the end, determined, hopeful. Some are so terrified, they don't move, they don't make a sound. They cower so low, trying to be invisible. Their only hope is that I don't find them because they know that these hands made their friends disappear. It is up to these hands of mine to bring them back to reality. And while they scream out in terror, resistance, everything I can't afford to express, these hands, they kill. Thank you so much. Oh my God, you guys, unmute your mics. Give it up for Maureen Medina. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marina, Medina. Yes. Nice one, sister. Nice one. A political one was cool. Let's go, Maureen Medina, everyone. Oh my God. I do feel bad, Maureen, because it's giving 75 degrees here today. <laughs> Sunshine, no clouds. And I'm like, I just want to like warm you up a little. <laughs> it's cold where you are. Oh, but thank you so much for your work and your poetry and thank you for being here and I'm so damn excited you're part of this team. Let's go. All right, it's not stopping. We're keeping going. And my apologies because I apparently cannot alphabetize shit. Uh, I wrote S down and then I wrote Stephanie. <laughs> so since the order is already going, we're going to stick to this order, but I will fix it for next time. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, I think it was done on because that's how I did the website. Did I screw it up on the website too? That's why. So I'll fix it on the website uh, because I have S before Stephanie on the website. Y'all, someone needs to keep me like straight. Keep me straight, please, y'all, because uh, I, you know, I am not infallible. If you see those kind of errors, please let me know and I will fix it. I'll fix it on the website too. All right. So we got S Putnam. Uh, again, another poet who I was blessed to just come across on Instagram and she has changed in my life. And I'm so excited that she's going to be joining us as we do the children's books later this year. Um, it is, uh, it's gonna be amazing. So yes, these poets, they come in and they, they move things around in your life in the best way. And then uh, Steph, you'll be on deck. All right, S.Z. Putnam is among American writer from Wisconsin, go Pat, go! I just gotta say that. Her works are composed from real life experiences. S.Z. has loved writing her entire life. She consumed works of literature in her youth, then thrived while expressing herself through words while attending college. After a midlife trauma, she stopped writing and only recently resumed. She has found poetry is an insight to her mind and helps navigate her healing journey. You can go to the website to find her links, where to get her on social media. Unmute your mics. Give a warm round of applause for our next poet, S.Z. Putnam. Woo! S. S. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Um, Speak the fire, girl. Thank you. So um, my, my book is called Loose Change, Picking Up the Pieces. And it's essentially me picking up the pieces of my life um, and all about living on the other side of addiction. Um, and the fallout that happens when someone you love is taken by it. So you know, um, it's a collection of love poems, dark love poetry, <laughs> and 
you know, my emotions. So here's the first one. It's called The First Time. I remember the first time I desired to be yours. Clear blue sky dialed down to blackened night. Diamonds carefully strewn overhead as if by your design. Fate was on your side. A symphony played by summer's caress and crickets is our song. Our melodic breathing, the unintentional duet. The flesh of my arms and neck flushed scarlet, goosebumps arising to greet your firm and gentle touch. Your hands held mine with the strength that didn't falter. Ironclad arms, a beckoning haven. The language of your body burned a hole in my defenses. Charcoal eyes blazed an uncontrolled fever. Unspoken words promising me forever. It was a single night of anticipation and longing for our souls to speak in harmony. You and I, the welcoming sound. This next piece is called Waterboarding. Your addiction waterboarded me, shocking my senses every time you poured your words over me. The icy coldness of it hit my lips, nose, my skin, the back of my throat, taking my breath away. There you stood in the shadows, a haunting silhouette juxtaposed in our home, dousing me in your shame, till I could no longer breathe controlling every breath I took until I was no longer me. And still, you would not, could not stop the flow. You were finally in control of something in your life, me. Tied down by the weight of your lies, I felt helpless to save myself, though I fought with all my might. I watched from afar as a dissociated ghost, you, strapping my earthly body down it was always against my will and i can still smell your faint scent coming off your worn out cloak as you laid it over my face it smothered me and the scent i once loved became a symbol of entrapment i lost a piece of myself each time with every session you drowned me on and off again endlessly and all for a few minutes of heaven. What a price to pay for a false sense of joy, for peace. My heart was bartered bit by bit, and now that you want it back, there may be nothing left of it for you. And then this one um, is called My Masterpiece. My masterpiece is almost complete. The swirls of anger and rage at life's despair are strewn across this canvas in jagged lines, most likely from my agitated movements. Wet acrylic stench mixed in with days of unrest is wafting off into the ears. I am high from the fumes, or maybe it's the sleep deprivation. Either way, I can't stop now, not when I'm so close to completion. I'm enraged, deranged, demented. I can't morph this piece fast enough. The image it covers is my novice piece, an innocent portrayal of love, beautiful lines and shapes, so smooth you could cut them like butter. Perfection, or so I thought. Heartbreak gilded in pieces so small they started as flecks on this piece, changing this work of art, changing me. Till one day I took a step back and looked and realized this painting was different. No longer was this love. This was unadulterated fury. Fury at life, the fates, the gods, anything and anyone. For no one could explain my heart's ache, choking me off like a fire without air. I run my paint-stained fingers across the piece. I trace every line. I feel every tormenting groove. This 
was destruction at my finest, my masterpiece. And that was it. I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> oh my God, S. Well, you've got, you've got like four or five, five more minutes. Okay. I can read one more piece. Oh yeah, you're totally welcome to keep going. And then um, I'll read Loose Change. This is one of the pieces I had written that really I felt encompassed everything I had been going through in terms of, you know, confusion and losing my way in what I wanted out of life. So this one is called Loose Change. Penny for a thought of yours. Thoughts. I would pay so much more than that, and I have paid, in the currency exchange of my heart. Each tear I dropped, the loose change remaining from my unspent words kept in my piggy bank. Piggies full, brimming full, full to the point of explosion with no more space to breathe, no more room to encourage the wondrous clinking joy from the collection within. I come upon a wishing well, abandoned and dried up from long ago, along with the wishes that were made in it. All that remains are the pennies conducting the chilled stones. Pennies. Change that no one wants but me. I try hurriedly to collect them all, clumsy in my haste. Try. So, so, so many wishes, wondering if I can collect them all. I'm on my knees, chest full of questions, gathering the change, collecting myself. Energy spent on the wrong task, more change unspent. I leave the change in the wishing well. There's too much to collect. I'll come back another day with another piggy. Defeated by my failed task, I go home to alleviate this weight I now bear. But I couldn't. I can't. I'm full now, much like my piggy, too full of change unspent. You try and add a penny, it doesn't fit. You're frustrated, as am I. You poke a little harder and I crack, shatter. Each piece hurls out from the destruction of this home for loose change, hurls at you. I lose myself in an endless scream, bottom of the wishing well. Loose change spent, but not on a wish, not on a trip. Oh man, you guys, unmute your mics, give it up for S Z. Amazing. Last oh, time. Ooh. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, the all of these incredible poets, right? It's just such a lucky meeting and opportunity to have found one another. I firmly believe that. Um, Steph is uh, certainly, uh, the, the, we're saving the best for last here today, so don't go anywhere because I mean the rest of the poets who are reading today are just like mind-blowing. Um, uh, uh, it was incredible. Thank you so, so very much. I can't wait to hear more from you. All right, Steph makes faces. Stephanie Eisler Vance is up next. I'm so excited to introduce this poet. She's the first one to have a final draft done. Not saying anything, but saying something. Ah, yes. Ah, let's go. Yes, I had a poke, poke, poke. All right, here we go. Uh, Stephanie Eisler Vance, y'all. She's a writer, spoken word poet, educator, and mental health advocate, advocate in Brooklyn, New York. In 2020, she founded the quote unquote, Make Yourself Collective, which fosters creativity and artistic skills for all ages. She performs regularly with Inspired Word NYC and the Nurekan Poets Cafe. She has a degree in cultural anthropology from Duke University and becomes, and excuse me, and believes that the that art saves lives. It saved hers. You can find her links on the website. Please unmute your mics, give a round of applause for Stephanie Eisler Vance, y'all. Yes, Stephanie. Woo. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Stephanie Eisler Vance. Um, my book is called Made of You. Um, it is 
covers themes like love and loss and uh, battles with errant brain chemistry, uh, to name a few. Um, it's split into three sections, mind, body, and heart. And the pieces I'm gonna read today are in order of appearance um, and I'll tell you which part they're in. Um, so the first piece is in the first section, mind, and it's called unstability. Before 2020, I enjoyed 10 years of what we in the biz call stability. This was a big deal. The previous five had been marked by more than a few deviations from sanity. And those 10 years allowed me to live my best approximation of a normal life. But it also gave me the desire for more, the belief that more was possible. So I stepped off a cliff into the unknown. And before I could set my feet, my stability smashed into a thousand pieces on the shore. They don't tell you about the fragility of stability, its rigidity, the brittle, tenuous construction of docility stability offers. Don't rock the boat, don't step onto it at all. On the off chance that you might drown, do not leave this protective shell we've created for you. Is it enough to say I'm stable? Wow, feels great to be stable. What a victory, what a coup. And it is, but it is not enough. Stability is smallness and apology. I am as big as the universe herself and I apologize for nothing. Stability lacks passion, makes an enemy of the self. True stability is unattainable anyway and not in that sexy kind of way. It's shame-ridden binary, reduces broad spectrum to black and white healing to inertia. I no longer wish to be stable. Now I hope for balance. Balance is within my grasp, a fluid state, elastic and adaptable. I cannot stop the storm from coming, but I can choose how to ride it out. To be stable is to cower in the basement. To be balanced is to tend to your home when the rain seeps in, to not panic at the sound of every thunderclap, to understand that the storm will eventually pass. My storms are made less ferocious, less fearsome, when I'm not so afraid of loud noises, when a deviation does not mean failure, just requires an adjustment to barometric pressure. To live in balance is to live on hard mode, but I am not afraid of hard rain, hard days, hard feelings. I am afraid of being so delicate, a piece of me gets washed away with the slightest change in the tides. I would much rather be the wave than the shore. The mountains can have their stability. I am the sea. So that's the first one. <coughs> mm, excuse me. Um, let's see, I'm only going to do three pieces today. Uh, this next one is called Bad Circulation and it is in the body section. Sometimes the tips of my fingers are so cold, touch screens don't respond to them. This makes my brain feel funny, failing a real life CAPTCHA challenge. I am alive. I think I just have bad circulation. I have bad circulation, but I am never cold. Heat emanates from my body like the clanking, sputtering radiator in my bedroom, temperamental and out of my control. My body is always warm, but the warmth rarely reaches my fingers or toes. My body is greedy like that. It cannot risk losing a single degree and all my extremities want to do is give it all away. The soles of my feet pound the pavement like punishment, like get me where I'm going and I'll give you something to lay out for. My feet point and flex and detect my center of gravity on hard wood lined with mirrors and ballet bars. They prefer to touch it without cotton interference, but my icy toes would be happier if they could feel the floor just a bit more. The tips of my fingers have more delicate sensibilities, the gentle gingerly touch of a hand that does not know what to do with itself, that does not know who would want the shock of fingers that feel dead, seeming to kill whatever they touch. I used to think I typed so hard from years of piano lessons, pressing keys with purpose. Now I wonder if it's my fingers way of generating heat, pumping blood into themselves and those keys. Bots can't write poetry, dead hands don't speak. Each day is an exercise in bringing them to life. The curse of my body's greed revealed to be a test of will, gift of the fight. What my extremities lack in warmth, they make up for in relentless determination. My circulation is bad, but nothing good comes easy. That was the second piece. 
And this is the last one I'll do. Um, it's from the heart section, the third section of my book. Um, it's called Pedestal. This is not a love song. This is an architect's lament, flaming torch, primer for my love. My love is not easy. My love is a moving target. My love is underused and overexcited, casually abused, habitually uninvited. It is no mystery why it created this pedestal. This pedestal is made of what I am made of, idle wishes and potential energy. So enamored with what could have been, I forget it was not. The height of this pedestal matches the breadth of my unworthiness. Anyone would rather be up there. Impossible to see wobble in my adoration without seeing wobble in myself to see that putting them up there meant they cannot touch me, cannot love me, but they can still hurt me. It has been so long since I tried without this pedestal, since anyone saw this, I don't know what's in there anymore. It's been even longer since they saw it and without stamping it out like a still lit cigarette. I have been a disposable drug for more men than I care to count. Forgive me if I no longer jump at the chance to be refuse. Forgive me if my bullshit detector is a bit sensitive. I am usually quietly right. I spend 20 minutes fretting over which bra to wear while he jerks it to his own reflection. Congratulations on how powerful you are up in those lofty heights where I put you. What he does not know is I do not give a shit about power. Power is boring, tedious. My pedestal is not about power. I just need them close, but far enough that they can't see me. My pedestal is my teetering fortress, my defense against those who would snuff me out mid stride. I do not sing love songs to the heavens. I do not plead with the gods to bring my love to me. I use those heights to steal myself for the fall I created in the first place. Do not think, I do not see the irony. But I am almost out of stone almost out of potential energy, almost ready to not want to feel so small. I am almost ready to bring this pedestal to its knees to see what a person on top of it is made of. My wishes now have movement and I must believe it is not too late to chisel this rubble into an offering to rediscover my own heart. I might be, maybe, almost ready to fall myself. Thank you. Oh man, you guys, Stephanie Eisler Vance, unmute your mics, give a warm round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you. Let's go. I see Shane in the house, y'all. Yes, Steph. Sorry, you can pre order my book, um, stephanieislervance.com slash book, or through the link in my Instagram bio, Steph Makes Faces. Awesome. Yes, please. Um, all of their bios, their handles, their links are on the website. If you don't, if you're not friends with them and you can't remember who they are, just go to the website, redergreenbooks.com, uh, red, R-E-A-G, right? You guys can go to the website. It has all of the information there for you. Uh, so you, there's a lot of posts to keep track of. And if you're like me, this looks, I'm still trying to keep track of them, right? Um, they're all in one place there. Click on their links, go get their stuff, go order their books. They'll, they'll put you on the list. They'll sign it and send it to you. Now, Shane is doing some live artwork. Y'all, let me spotlight her real quick before it gets to Terry Rose, because I didn't notice she was doing this. Holy <laughs> moly, Shane, that is beautiful. Who's, what's that for? This is for one of the poets. So yeah! this is the mock-up. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh my God, that is gorgeous. Yes, yes, yes. And so I'm working on the proof now. Um, but yeah, I I really love listening to y'all. And then while I'm working on the art, I think I might make that a tradition from here on out. Mm. But you yeah, should. I'm excited. It's very cool. That is that is super dope. I I cannot wait to see all of these artists um, cover arts. I've seen a few of them so far. They've been completed, and it is just stunning. Absolutely stunning. I love the movement in that. It's very whimsical and light. And oh, I want to get swept away in that cover already. Uh, so yes, I'm so excited. So Shane. 
We're going to have Terry Rose come up and read. And if you want a spotlight uh, to talk about you and Guerrilla Poets and the artwork and the Fierce 15, uh, I'll totally give you that spot. I do not see Thomas Connor here. Uh, he must have gotten caught up at work or, or whatever. Uh, it's unfortunate that he's not here today because his work is very standout as well. All right, Terry Rose, are you ready, my beautiful friend? She's also in the Women's Erotic Anthology with, of course, uh, Elizabeth Strauss. And um, I think Lizzie's the only other one who's in the Women's Erotic Anthology on this launch. All right, Terry Rose, take it away. Hi, um, I'm gonna read Winter is Coming. This is the most erotic piece I probably ever wrote. <laughs> and it's in my poetry book. The white march down of my pillowcase feathers floating above my head as I peek below my waist. There is a man carving out his place. From beneath my hips, writhing in deep tongue pressure, heaping mouthfuls of pleasure, plowed up around him. So easily he staked his claim on my ever loving mound. I do not envy the industriousness of his hot muscle task. But then imagine feeling my heartbeat alive like a dam being torn down by this irreverent beaver, hard at work in my river. I imagine the whole day, tongue sore and beaming with accomplishment as the dawn overtakes us with heavy breathing and satisfying sighs. He lingers between my thighs, swimming inside my body. He thrusts to answer my ever beckoning calls to hidden places, eagerly filling every cavity in me his spirit yelped as he released, giving up his ghost was my greatest pleasure. And the little spit of story behind that one was that was actually a different poem altogether. And it, it just, I got talking with another poet about how something can so easily turn into an erotic piece. And it was a challenge that she gave me to go more with it to keep on going with this idea. You, you know what I just realized, Terry Rose? I did not read your bio. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm getting into like the open mic vibe where I'm like, oh, it's Terry Rose and everyone knows her. Um, so if you don't, all right, so let me read your bio real quick because I'm like, wait, 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 I'm missing something. I'm missing something. Uh, my apologies, my beautiful friend. I'm so Go excited ahead. to hear from you. Go ahead. I was like, I can't even waste time talking. <laughs> Terry Rose Jerson is an artist, wife, mother, and peer recovery specialist. She began writing poetry in 2020 as a way to cope with the new normal. She regularly attends open mics and has featured on many platforms. The proceeds of this book will benefit Arbor Day with the expected release in 20, in spring 2022. She is a contributor in the erotic anthology entitled Touching Tongues from Red or Green Books. She hails from New Jersey. Y'all, my apologies. Unmute your mic. Give it up for Terry. Jersey's best in the house. Ooh, Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I've lived, I'm a, I've been here my whole life, um, but recently, or not that recently now, but before the pandemic, I actually got to Europe. So that was like, great. I finally got out of New Jersey. Thank you, God. <laughs> but, you know, home is home. So this is my home and it's always going to be my home no matter where I move. So here's a, you know, shout out for New Jersey. Okay. So I have a lot of wildlife in my backyard. There's everything, squirrels, skunks, uh, you know, uh, stray cats, um, you know, beavers, snakes, everything. So, um, and this is really a little city. So it's kind of weird that we have all this wildlife just trapped kind of in here. But so this one's about a chipmunk. Beware of these seemingly harmless woodland beasts, killer chipmunks. Normally these little guys are so adorbs, but people forget they are not pets of yours. Children and adults alike must be warned. These mammals are not logical. They're not trained. They're wild, they're not vaccinated. Should you get too close and receive a painful bite, get yourself to a hospital before you lose your life. The woods contain other things like chiggers and ticks, but rabies can be deadly. So remember to be safe because angry chipmunks can be dicks. <laughs> Let's go. Thank 
go. <laughs> and I have some haikus. I really like that form. Um, and it just, sometimes when I have writer's block, it really gets me going. So if I, especially if like the aphrastic workshops where there's a picture and I'm kind of like, oh my God, what is that? What do I say? If I get it like a haiku, I can get it going. So I um, actually wrote this and I'm a lot of workshops. So I wrote this in one of the workshops I was in. Um, happiness happens, hopefully, honestly one. Happy honey bun. Happiness happens, hover on clouds or earthbound, heavenly harp sounds. Happiness happens, hidden in tearful faces, holding heart spaces. And I have one about truth and one about lies. So truth first. There's a song that says you have to be true to be kind in the right measure. I never really understood what that meant because any time in the past that I was true with my words, they were not always kind. In my life, to be kind is to hold your tongue because people rarely want to hear the truth. And now lies. Lies. Your mouth continues to spit them out. They flow so easily from the innocent look on your face, swearing that the stories are fact, not fiction, until I prove them false and confront you. Squirming, knowing you were caught again, in my anger, I scream. You do not flinch. You could care less like a buzzing fly in your ear, a mere annoyance. Just breathe, I say to myself, this too shall pass until the next time. And then I have this mysterious thing called love, uh, which is always a theme throughout my book. So this one's called Love um, is a Mystery I Don't Understand. Once sizzling due to a five-year self-imposed abstinence from another dysfunctional pairing, and when the fast was broken, thirst quenched over and over again until left exhausted of any future desire, came 10 years of obligatory wifely duties, leaving me exhausted of any future desire to sizzle, left to fizzle. That was 10 years of my life that I will never get back, which left me exhausted over the futility of sizzling sex and marriages that die a slow and pointless death. Unions that bring relief when finally over, fractured relationships that still hold the mystery of how they were sewn together with a dull needle. When we last spoke, we both agreed that we failed to answer this impossible question or silence the infinite yearning of brokenheartedness caused by misunderstanding this mysterious thing called love. And I have this one called the one forgotten, too basic to stand out, too old to be young and fresh, too mediocre to be great, too non-ethnic to be ethnic, too fat to be skinny, too weird to be cool, too tired to be energetic, too private to be exposed, too broke to be extravagant, too conservative to be erotic, too evil to be good. And if the, only the good die young, that means I will live forever, only to be forgotten. And then there's this one I wrote most recently called Unwanted Gift. Did you ever get one of those gifts that was an afterthought with no effort made to hide that sad, sad fact? Moreover, you tried to be gracious and smile, but all you really wanted to do was throw it down on the ground, sit on it or step on it. Feeling guilty though, upon realizing they were Valentine's Day confections with which symbolizing love made you consider this feeble attempt as the best they had to offer at the time. On that note, did you ever eat a bite of cake that was so subpar that you wanted to spit it out and scrape that nasty off your tongue with a knife? Nothing like the cupcake war winner down the street. It was a near miss, only a block away. Afterthought caused them to buy Wawa cupcakes, 
the like of which were so tasteless and processed that on my deathbed, I will surely be nicely preserved. On the other hand, have you ever wished to be slathered from head to toe with the creamy filling and gorgeous frosting of the most satisfying cake that ever longingly graced your lips? Have you ever imagined your partner assisting in this cacophony of sweetness by licking said cake off places that you cannot reach? Why does my mind always return to this scenario? Maybe this is my happy place. I have heard of such retreats of the mind, or is this just another fantasy? Am I searching for a distraction that completely engages my senses? I have no idea. Maybe in this sensual scenario, it is just an afterthought where no one gets hurt. Do I have more time or is that it? You, yeah, you got a few more minutes. You could do another short thing or whatever you want. I have this one called for my biggest heartbreak. He said, he was interested in the Holocaust, which was my first red flag. In my mind, there was no relation of that horrific event to him. He accusingly inquired, don't you know what my nationality is? Again, still not following. He was a bunch of things, but not Jewish. He said to me, you know, I usually only go out with Jewish girls. I thought you were Jewish when I first met you, but now pointing to my stomach, pregnant with his baby, as if to say he would be gone if it wasn't for that mistake, I shot him a look that said, how dare you refer to your child in that hateful unspoken tone. Later, he would repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly show me in the Old Testament, in the book of Joel, where it speaks about the coming of the Holocaust, it says that the covers are too short for the bed. He would painfully highlight different places with pen where he was convinced that God had foretold this only to him and the Jewish people. The only chosen ones. He said this to me in a demeaning way as if association would save him. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy was his answer. The best thing that ever happened to him he would never realize. For him, it was just another day when we were walking on the Atlantic City boardwalk. He shouted to the sky, God, if you're real, show me a sign. And out of the blue, as if to answer him and hitting him right in the head, came a small change purse with some coins in it. Perhaps symbolizing the 30 pieces of silver paid to the betrayer of Jesus, or perhaps it was a wise old woman in the crowd of people who wanted this lunatic to shut up, begging the question, was this his sign? Or was this God's way of asking him to put his money where his mouth was? Thank you. <laughs> Let's go, Terry Rose, jerks and everybody on your mic. Do it up. Yeah, Terry, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, let's go today. Sh uh, Shane, I'm I'm looking at Shane's uh, artwork. Is that my artwork it? she's working on? I'm really curious. Let me <laughs> spotlight it for everyone so y'all can see what she's doing. Uh, what that, is up? That is uh, some artwork. Uh, I love how it's coming to life as we are doing this. Is that event. for me, Shane? <laughs> it is not. This is actually a, a different one, but yours is in my pile to start coloring, and it's right here. Oh, okay. Oh, I love it. Oh, look at all the chameleons in the hair. Yes. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't mention the name of my book is going to be The Chameleon Chronicles. I and, love it. And another poet gave me that name, uh, Generalissimo, if you know who he is. He, uh, he called me the chameleon one day. Yeah, Generalissimo is the uh, one of the uh, next 10 poets here at Rhetoric Green Books. I love how these poets for generation to generation are paying it forward uh, to all of our poets. I love it. I'm digging it. Yeah, it came out great. super cool. I love that one. That one, everybody fought over because it was two different. <laughs> there was two different proofs. It was either this or it was this. And there was a whole, <laughs> there was a whole argument that went down in my house about... <laughs> 
<laughs> which one? The, this one definitely won. Everybody was like, "No, it's gotta be. It's gotta be the chameleon hair." Yes. Very and then this cool. Is S's. Cool. Ooh, S's. I love that. Oh wow! Oh my! She has this poem about rice raining. It is. Uh, it moved me to tears when I heard it on Instagram. Um, yeah. Wishing well. Oh man. And then we've got Gary. Oh, Gary! Look at Big Ben in the background. I love it. Oh, man. That is so intricate and very cool. I'm sure it's going to be so colorful, y'all. He used to be a track and field coach. My big boys loved it today, and the whole of the restaurant loved it. <laughs> we had it's a Mother's awesome. Day celebration, and, the, and, and I'll show my boys because I was home, and they, oh, um, so you, my eldest is 26. Yeah, would like to propose to you, with my book cover. Yes, Andy, she can work on yours too. No worries. There's so much, so many amazing things happening uh, in this press, y'all. Oh, wow. And for those of you who are not familiar with Shane's work, go to the website, look at the other, tw she's done 20, well, there's been 19 covers now she's done, um, 18, 19 that she's done now for us. And I believe she's doing 13 of the 15 or 12 of the 15 covers for this launch. Uh, plus she's doing my book, Barfing Up the Butterflies, plus the LGBTQ anthology, which is coming up. So that is uh, super, super exciting. Um, all the things that, that we are doing uh, as, as we move forward uh, at Red or Green Books. So uh, thank you all so much. Again, we had Anthony Harris, Eddie Youssef Aziz, Elizabeth Oots, Elizabeth Sophia Strauss, Gary Huskisson, Hill Hoover, Kimberly Kamey Anderson, Christy Scribbles, Lantern Carrier, Maureen Medina, Patty Orozco, S.Z. Putnam, Stephanie as other Vance, Terry Rose Dursen. Uh, we missed Thomas Connor tonight, but uh, Shane Maynard is here from Gorilla Post doing the artwork, and I'm just so freaking thrilled um, at the quality of, of these covers, y'all. It is just sensational. Uh, the next show is scheduled May 15th. It'll be similar to this. Uh, we will be unveiling the finished cover art, uh, be taking pre-orders. The poets will have uh, their links for their pre-orders set up by then. Uh, uh, some of them have the pre-orders available already. Uh, the pre-orders for the entire Fierce 15 are up on the website. We've already uh, have one pre-order for, for the entire collection. So I'm very excited that we're getting momentum as a launch. And then we will do the book signing in July. Don't forget, August 7th is the Poet Palooza, where we invite back all of the authors from Red or Green Books to read. You have all received an email with a Google Docs link that has uh, the signups. So if you have not signed up for a slot in that event, you need to do so. Uh, it's an opportunity if, if you are uh, part of the launch from last year to get in front of a whole new audience, kind of revive uh, your, your sales, your books, all of that wonderful stuff. Uh, and if you are brand new, part of the Fierce 15, you definitely want to get in front of some of these uh, more seasoned poets who've been doing it a little while who have had their book out for a bit uh, so that you can show them what you are all about. All right, the raffle is going on from now until Poet Palooza, $5 for a ticket, uh, five for 20 or 30 tickets for hundred bucks and it's for the entire collection of all 15 books. Uh, you don't wanna miss out on that. Uh, all of the details are on the website, red or greenbooks.com, red, R-E-A-D. Otherwise, does anyone need anything before we wind down and close the show today? Did everyone get a chance to go? Everyone got to do what they wanted today? All right, well, I'm gonna ask everyone to unmute and to just give all of our poets a huge round of applause for their performance. Great work, everyone, tonight. Great work tonight, everyone. Incredible job. Woo. Get excited. Great work, great work. A lot of good <laughs> For real, keep real. Let's Keep doing go, right? it, guys. Get excited. Yes, you're part of this launch. Yes, you deserve to be here. Yes, uh, we are all behind you, pushing you up. 
poet. So let's go. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Word is Right in Red or Green Books tonight. I've been your host slash publisher, Marissa Prada. If you need anything, poets, reach out to me. Let me know. Those of you in the audience, feel free to go to the website. Many of your questions will be the answered there. And as always, you can email me, Marissa, at redorgreenbooks.com. Uh, I will definitely do my best to... Uh, get you hooked up with these poets and answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing all of you May 15th. Much love and light. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and I will go ahead and turn off the live. And uh, if anything, um, I will be here for you. <laughs>